be listening to Thieves, Misers, Bullies, the most detestable collection of people that you will ever hear. My podcast. Uh, okay, sure. I'm trying to think what would be good. David was <laughs> finishing. I, someone asked David's me a question that email. was really interesting just as you started doing that. Well, which that's is why bad isn't, timing. I know, it was terrible timing, which is why isn't, he's obsessed with my podcast. I have a friend who's obsessed with my podcast. Okay, it's I'm, a, I'm sorry, which podcast? Uh, this one. Right, our podcast? That we're doing right now. Our and he podcast. asked why The Sixth Sense isn't available for streaming, and I don't know the answer. Yeah, I don't either. I don't know, is that a Hollywood Pictures thing? Yeah. Goes all the way back to the beginning so of once my again, podcast. I, I just make it He's very... watching The Sixth Sense because he loves this podcast. No, no, no. no. I, yeah. I just want to make it very clear. Uh, we were recording our podcast, and someone asked you a question mm -hmm. about the mm -hmm. podcast, mm -hmm. and you chose to prioritize that over the record. I thought you were going to do something really long, so honestly, I was strapping in for that. Well, that's, that's on you, bro. <laughs> Sorry. That's on you. I'm trying to think of another... I just thought that scene Spicy was. I thought he quote. talks for longer in that scene. I mean, I think he talks on either side of that. See, see this. I'm trying to keep people on their toes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm both going. Both of you are going like, if there are five pages of dialogue in that scene, wouldn't Griffin do? You know all what I five thought you pages? were going to do? Well, what? I, I will, yeah, the, the. I think the, we thought the same thing. The the sort of like all I had to do was offer you a drink monologue that he uh. does, which is such a good Scars Guard monologue. I mean, that's a long But it's long. Month. Well, you know what? Yeah. You occasionally, we'll do a long one. Yeah. And I like to mix <sighs> things up. Do you want to do it again? Put your hand yeah, back I'd in like, my podcast. I'd like a bigger response. All right. All right. Here we go. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Wait. But, so wait, we want to. Why isn't The Sixth Sense on streaming at all? I don't know. It, don't you think that's kind of weird? Yeah, it's a hot movie. I feel like that's a movie you just see on TV. Well, but you're saying it's not rentable. To be clear, I, I believe it. It may be rentable, but it's on any other streaming service. It's I not on a that's Hulu. Weird. That fucking happens. Seems all the normal. Time. Yeah. And so, just so we're clear, we're gonna actually start over. This is in the episode. No, all of this is in the fucking episode. Mm. All okay. of this you can rent is in it. the episode. You can rent it, but that seems to be the uh, only ben, way you can watch. It. All of this is in the episode. Maybe like at the end. Maybe at the beginning when the episode starts. Okay, starting when you do the quote. <laughs> All of this was in, and I'm going to do the quote now, and remember... All right, I actually now think it's funnier if this is at the end, just because you've said it has to be at the beginning <laughs> no. so many times. This is at the beginning, and I'm going to do the quote, and get ready and be listening, because remember, the quote is short. Okay, ready? Let me ask you something. Why don't people trust their instincts? They sense something is wrong, something is walking too close behind them. You knew something was wrong, but you came back into the house. Did I force you? Did I drag you in? No. All I had to do was offer you a drink. It's hard to believe that the fear of offending can be stronger than the fear of pain. But you know what? It is. And they always come willingly. And then they sit there. They know it's all over just like you do, but somehow they still think they have a chance. Maybe if I say the right thing. Maybe if I'm polite. If I cry. If I beg. And when I see the hope draining from their face like it is from yours right now, I can feel myself getting hard. You know, we're not that different, you and I. We both have urges. Satisfying mine requires more podcasts. There you go. <laughs> Instead of towels, I believe is what yep. you yeah. <laughs> I get hard listening to podcasts. It's just so you're you're really like arrested by that monologue, and then he's like, I'm getting hard, and you're like, whoa. And then you're like, <laughs> I mean, I, right, I guess that's what's going on with you. He I, mentions I, yeah. that he's getting hard as if he's listing another uh, item off his shopping list. <sighs> Jesus. Like, oh, by the way, I'm also hard right now. <laughs> God, it's so good. And then he makes it clear. He's like, oh, I don't really do men. That, I mean, we'll talk. Look, I want to say, one, spoilers for the girl with the dragon tattoo. Still in Skarsgård is villainous in There's this, this film. astonishing twist. I mean, we were just talking about Six Sense. But you talk about the greatest twist in movie history that you cannot see coming. Okay, so this was my biggest note about Dragon Tattoo when I first saw the movie. Yeah. I had not read the book. Yeah. I didn't know anything. I knew there was a murder mystery. Uh -huh. And Skarsgård walks in, and I'm like, hey, the case is closed. 911, please. <laughs> like, come to this guy's house. It took you that long, David? <laughs> Opening credits, you see sure. his name, single card. You think I should call the police then and be like, please, I'm watching a movie. Stop Skarsgård. Place him under arrest. Right. <laughs> I agree with you that I think it's a somewhat intentional move. Well, no. Now, right. Now, my feeling with 
about it has changed quite a lot. But but um, the biggest reason to have Skarsgård, obviously, in my opinion, is who can do you know that shit better than him? He's so good at it too. And can I front load this just because this quote is top of mind, mm. top of the mind, uh, uh, in the commentary for the motion picture Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, two thousand eleven. Uh, I think it's the first scene where he goes over for dinner at Skarsgård's house sure, with his early girlfriend, on. right? Um, or maybe it's maybe it's in the house. No, I because I think it's in that early scene. Whatever, it doesn't fucking matter. The point is in an early benign scene. Yes, he said the reason I want to cast Skarsgård as the villain, and I think he's one of the best in the world at playing villains, is no one. He he says I here's the exact quote. Son Skarsgård is the most relaxed person on earth. He is so incredibly comfortable in his own skin and confident. And for me, that's that's the point where people start to re-question their definition yes. of evil. Right, right, right. Which is such a good... I've never heard someone put it that way. I love that. And I especially think when we're talking about like... And that's true of like all those Lars von Trier characters he's played yes. over the years or whatever. Right. Yes. But when they're people... they're not just monsters. When we get into this chicken egg conversation of like, why are so many wildly successful people also seemingly like horrible degenerates, right? Sure. And you're like, do they become successful to cover up their shit? Or does the something success, about becoming success their brain. break their brain? Right. Finster just fucking nails it. It's obviously not a, a, a an umbrella answer for all the cases, right? But there's something about people who become like masters of the universe in any sphere, where then they start to go like, huh, maybe I should like reassess all my my beliefs on morality. Like maybe all my thoughts on the world are a little black and white because they're just like, well, I figured my shit out. Friend, my shit's set. Thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. You want to weigh in? I'm on, good. Uh, on on psychopathy and celebrity. I think at the time I saw this movie, I really only knew Stellan from Pirates. So Bootstrap Bill. Bootstrap Bill. Bootstrap Bill. So Bootstrap I allowed Bill. myself to feel surprised he when I first saw show. it. Well, he's Bootstrap Bill's a good guy. That's a good guy. That's, That's a good not guy. when I first saw it, I felt that there was a different thing that was telegraphed. Interesting. Too obviously. That she has a dragon tattoo. Yeah. They do show you the dragon tattoo. They do uh, kind of make do, you wait for it, though. They make you, you wait, make you and wait. you were like, "Yeah, I fucking knew it was coming." It's and you're not, also like, "Well, I didn't want to see it like this, you know." It, it not not the best circumstance. Yeah. Go ahead. It's not a good tattoo. Uh huh. No. Mm. She's a young woman who's gotten a lot of tattoos, and I think you know some of them. She more just got like to get a in the it books. Looks like it's it giving mall in the do books. You know what I mean, Does that yeah, make sense? yeah, like mm -hmm. mall tattoo. Yeah. Uh, in the books, like it Darth is her Maul. entire back. It's it even looks like Darth Maul's face tattoo. You're saying. In the second one, she's getting some of her tattoos removed, yes. which feels very like, okay, now she's like in her late 20s, early 30s, where she's like, time to rethink this. I know that it's only the English language title, because the, the Swedish title was The Men Who Hate Women. Men right? Who Hate Women. Right. Uh, which I'd argue is a better title for what the story's about, but less it's catchy. It's not a highly commercial title. No. <laughs> Men <laughs> some hatar kivinor. It would be now. Now, men who hate women. Yeah, yeah, we'd be like, like half the people would be like they do, and half the people would be like, and it's good. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I like it. I like hating women. Uh, no, I was just gonna say, it feels a little reductive to call her uh, the girl with the dragon tattoo. I'm like, she's got a lot of stuff going on. The girl who goes on computer. I wouldn't say dragon tattoo <laughs> is top ten of what's it's interesting. One of the best about movies about going on a computer. One we're of the. I mean, we're definitely gonna talk she about how about computer, this she is. Makes things different. This is number one movie about go on computer, but. Um, no, it's just, well, the reason it's called The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo uh -huh. is the second book in Sweden, Swedish is called The Girl Who Played with Fire. Right. And I guess they decide, and then the third book is called The Air, the Castle in the Air That Exploded. Yeah. Well, so, is that true? Yes. Uh, which is like a sort of Swedish aphorism for like, you know, man plans and God right. laughs. Was converted to Girl Who Kicks the Hornets. <laughs> I think they were just like, of these three titles, The Girl Who is a pretty good template for us to follow. So yeah. Let's, yeah. let's spread that to the others. Yes. <laughs> Rather than be like, hey, men who hate women. Like, you, you taking an airplane? You want to read this? But also, it's still dragon tattoo. I'm just like. She's got a dragon tattoo. It's a big dragon. Rawr. Even if we're going physical attributes, I don't go dragon tattoo top five. What well, you wanted the the ninety pound hacker who yeah. you know I don't know it's has crazy a lot of she's piercings. Only, she only has the eyebrows. mohawk for the intro. Yes, sure. That's so like such an iconic image. But then like the rest of the time, you can tell her heart is not into that. No, it also just felt like they were like we got to check this off the list. Yeah, but like the sooner we get her away from the specifics of how Numi Rapace looks, the better for us. Yeah, you know. Um, yeah. Well, isn't it sort of a choice, though, somewhat, like that she's 
sort of becoming a little bit like less extreme throughout the movie and like her it, look is becoming her, less her look intense. is not yeah like her look in my opinion mm-hmm. and we're going to talk a lot about the this girl who has the look the girl is a better title. i'm going to talk to this about this with the girl in the uh, floral print shirt yeah well it's it's i can't really it's fruit it's, oh, it's fruit sorry. the woman yeah. who is six foot two five eleven Five eight, no, five please eight, come on. Um, Not a freak. Is her look is supposed to be like just get away from me? I don't want you to yes. touch me. Yeah. Um. And then in the climax of the third book, which is where she has to give this testimony, uh-huh. she goes all in. She goes crazy. She's got like a huge mohawk okay. all of a sudden and stuff. And that is more her doing like a sort of dominance display. She sort of she a has a, a Phil Spector approach to the courtroom. <laughs> Did you like the third book more than the second, or you were like whatever on both? Because the third one's the whole is trial. So you read them after seeing this movie? Okay, so, all right. Introduce our podcast and our guests, and then I'll tell you the okay. answer to that question. This is Blank Check with Griffin and David. I am Griffin. And I'm David. I took a sip. I was, I trying, slowed trying down. Trying to get me. No, I oh, slowed down. Oh, you slowed down. down. Right, right. You, yeah. Cool. To let you finish the sip. Thank you. It's a podcast about filmographies. The podcast. With the filmography, uh, with the context. Yes. I don't know, whatever. Yes. No, you got this. You I got was going to say, you're really close to this. it. No, I think no, you do. No. The hosts who still don't know how to keep their podcast on rails. <laughs> the hosts who played with context. Yes. <laughs> the um, friends who played with context. Yes. Uh, it, it's about filmographies, directors who have massive success early on in their careers and are given a series of blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce. Baby, this is a mini series on the films of David Fincher. Mm-hmm. It is called... The Curious Pod of Benjamin but cast. Correct. It is not called The Pod with the Dragon Cast 2. Or whatever. A few of those were floated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but that is the movie we're talking about today, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. What was on its face, his biggest blank check in a lot of ways. I think Benjamin Button ended up being the bigger one, but this was such a like... It's a good question. Actually. You know what? This can't miss. We're rolling out the red carpet for you. You do this your fucking certainly, way. I mean, like, all right, R-rated is R-rated. In England, yeah. this is certainly, I'm sure, rated 18, right? Yeah. Which is higher than the regular rating, a 15. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, like, you're going to get this huge budget. But then, of course, you know, could it be a total blank check if it's, like, a huge bestseller? I don't know. Like, you know, that's like, that's question. helping write the check. But yes. it's probably the closest to, you know, I want 100 million plus, 150, 150 mil yeah. to do... An F. Scott Fitzgerald story about Brad Pitt turned into baby, old man Brad. It is maybe yes. biggest blank check. No, I think that, And I think he would say that. He was like, I spent years rolling that up yeah, the hill. Right. Yeah. I think that ends up being the bigger blank check. But this was the rare kind of like, this cannot miss project. And I think it's also, here's stuff that David Fincher finds interesting, which he's going to be allowed to make on a really big scale and budget because the book is such a bestseller that people won't question it. If you brought this in as a spec script, they'd be like, sure, here's $500,000, right? You cannot put this on screen. This is unbearably dark. Mm, There's something to the book being so successful that, like, studio thinking goes out the window. Not that they weren't panicked about this movie in many ways. They were excited and they were panicked. Look, it was a blockbuster bestseller book, and we needed a blockbuster bestseller guest. (laughs) That's Someone who, who t- point. fucking breaks the podcast charts every time without fail. Yeah. Fran Hoffner, Fran Magazine. Yeah. Uh, hi, Fran. Hi. So. The lady with the fruit sleeve tattoo. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the better I do the girl with the fruit tattoos. That's yeah. right. I'm you have a lady. Of... I'm saying lady to be a little more. If girl feels a little diminutive. Call me a girl. I don't care. Okay. I'm only, I'm only 24. I mean, when you were on our I live forgot. show, you introduced yourself by saying, girl, guess, girl, yeah, guess. Yeah, girl, guess. Okay. The baby with the fruit sleeve tattoo. The baby. The yeah. 5'8 baby with the fruit mm-hmm. sleeve tattoo. Um, now, Fran, Francis, um, you and I, well, we going into, we, we set that you were going to do this months ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had seen The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo in theaters and then maybe a couple times since then. My esteem for it had always risen, but I'd never read the books. Mm-hmm. And I'd never seen the Swedish films or anything like that. Right. And I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to read all the books. Yeah, and I said I was going to do it too. Right. And you read this book. Well, then I read all the books and I was like, Fran, just read the first book. Like, yeah. Don't, don't, don't read the sequels. I am like a third of the way into the second one. 
And 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 like then you got you, a lot of book left, my friend. I know. It, I was sort of unaware of how much longer They're and denser so long. the sequels are. And I know you told me there was kind of a kind of significant drop off between In my opinion, one and yes. two and three. Um, I'm starting to like two now, but it's like I really had to wade through some stuff. You didn't read any of the post Larson books, did you? No, they seem beyond pointless to me. And I have, of course, seen the the Girl in the Spider's Web. I saw it. I almost watched it. that also, just because I'm almost want to rewatch it, but I I decided to wait till after this, just because I didn't want to like the actually consensus break on my it brain. is just so like everyone hates that movie. I mean, it is very bad, and she's really bad in it, unfortunately. And Rooney is so good, in my opinion, that like. It's it's a tough performance. So I I, I hope to. I'm allowed to say this, and if I'm not, Ben, AJ, or Alex, I will tell you to cut this out. But like something kind of astonishing about how ill advised that reboot was, especially when the thing that everyone liked most about this movie was that performance, mm -hmm. and how quickly they abandoned it. No, uh, it's cra it's like what is it? 2017, right? 2018. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, you know what America should have again is. Elizabeth Salander fever. 2018. Past and future guest, friend of the show, Tatiana Maslany. Yes. Tested for both versions, I she believe. Did. Right. That, that's the thing. The window is tight enough that yes. she made sense both, both times. Both times. Yes. Which, like, in and of itself tells you this is a bad idea. It's just so weird. I don't understand, and we'll talk about this later because obviously it's not the... But, like, fine. If you don't want to pay Fincher to do it, you can still, Rooney Mara still wants to do yes, it. Yes. Maybe Daniel Craig kind of didn't. Maybe that was part of the problem. But then in that case, that's the one you recast. He's really important to the sequels. It would be tough to recast him. I don't know. I don't know. I, I No, I just think you're right that like. Just do the fucking sequels. Like, yes. it'll make some money. The, the, whole, the whole problem with this, and we'll talk about it, but like this movie had such astronomical hype around it because the books were so fucking massive. And in other cases of shit like Da Vinci Code or uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, where there's a best-selling book, but you're like, I don't know how they turn this into a movie. I don't know how you pull this off at a studio level. I don't understand what you gain by putting an insane budget behind it. But they would all fucking pay off mm. at the box office. And this one disappointed relatively. And then they're in this weird position where they're like, well, we've made these movies. We basically set a template of, producing them at a blockbuster budget with a director who is very exacting and now is it too expensive to make a sequel relative to what we know our audience is so. yeah. one star who's already huge one star who's gotten bigger because of this but it was dumb of them to even try doing it without her and dumb to do one of the other books um that's enough on the girl in the spider's web though a movie because we're here to talk we're not about covering. vicky creeps and not covering on vicky creeps is in it she plays the robin wright role. that's so funny she does yeah. Wow. But it, for like five seconds. And who plays the Daniel Craig part? Um, Like a fucking, no offense to who would I assume is like a solid Scandinavian actor, but a yeah. fucking random. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his name but is. Kleist Bang is in there, right? Sver, he, yeah, he is. Kleist Bang plays a villain heavy type. Uh, Sver good Nassen. Okay. Who we all know for playing uh, Bjorn Borg in Borg versus oh, McEnroe. Yes. Uh, and Lakeith's in it too. Yes, he is. He's he an plays American. the guy who befriends the girl. And with the fucking dragon Stephen Hesser. Merchant is in it. Like it's a bizarre oh, yeah. cast. Yeah. And and Sylvia Hooks uh, from oh, yeah. uh, you know she? Blade, Blade Runner. Runner. Well, she's in the girl. She's in the Spider's Web. Well, where's she been since then? She's, been caught she's in the still in there. <laughs> it's hard to get out of there. <laughs> um, because in all three of um, Larson's books, mm -hmm. Steve Larson's books, the the Millennium Trilogy, as sure. it's known. Uh, it is often mentioned, especially in the sequels, that Lisbeth has a sister who she does not know. Okay. And you know that Larson had many books planned before mm -hmm. he died that he never wrote. Mm -hmm. And it's clear the sister was going to be a part of it. So she's a big part of Girl in the Spider's Web and Sylvia Hooks plays the sister. Gotcha. Uh, okay. She's a like twin, a big no? gangster. I can't remember. Maybe, yes. I think yes. maybe a twin. I just read all these books and I already forgot. Kate, Kate Mara. But the I, mean, I mean, that's sitting there if fucking, they ain't fucking bothered with. Yeah. yeah, it's true. Okay, here's a question. I, we got a lot to talk about, but I'm just going to I'm going to say it because we're already on this topic. OK. Could they just announce tomorrow? You know what? We're doing it. Fincher, Craig, Rooney Mara. Is anything fucked up by them having waited 10 years? And Rooney um, Mara is almost 40. I don't think she could do this anymore. That would be tough. She's almost 40 years old. Elizabeth's supposed to be like 24. 
I'm asking as someone who just read the books. Yeah. Do you think there is no way they can rewrite it to have a greater amount of time pass? Um. D- no, does, they definitely could. Do the events of the books she need could. to have happened in immediate succession? No, I think no. The sequel a big is, part of has two a jump. Is, is that there is this they're jump? They're not and friends she anymore. Sort, they're not friends anymore. Okay. She changes her appearance mm-hmm. a lot. She's getting the tattoos she removed. Gets a boob she gets job. a boob job. Is sort of a big really? Yes. Yeah, because she's plot like, point? yeah. I mean, this is sort of where these books drive me insane. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, she's like, I'm sick of looking like you like know a, a ninety year old little girl. So I'm right. gonna get a boob job. I mean, she doesn't get like a crazy boob job. She gets like it would be good. funny if, she, if the book was like, <laughs> and then she got way too big. Which she's there is dragging these things around. There's like she went full Angeline. <laughs> There's like three too many scenes of her like looking at herself in the mirror and being like, finally, my the, womanly breasts. The I thing, love admiring them. Jesus. The thing about the sequels are is that like right, they're more Elizabeth, they're more Elizabeth forward in a way. Right. Uh they are all about her. But you said the Daniel Craig character is really important in that. Well, because then she gets the shit kicked out of her and she's in a hospital for like a lot sorry, spoilers. Okay. Uh for like a lot of uh book two and almost and pretty much in the entirety of book three. Mm-hmm. Um, no, maybe not a lot, but a, a fair, like, and then, so then it has to be Blomqvist just, like, send, the other problem with the sequel, look. Is he getting revenge on her behalf? He's trying to it's help all, her. It, okay. it goes all the she way to the top. She doesn't want his help. It goes, the all whole thing this, with the books is it goes everything. all the way to the top. But the books become about her rather than her being a character who's in, entangled in other mysteries. Exactly. The basically. huge problem okay. with the sequels is they are, the, the huge what is so good about the girl with the dragon tattoo is it's a murder mystery set on a remote Swedish island filled with rich Nazis. You're like, uh-huh. I love this. This is yeah. so interesting. Yeah. The sequels are all about the mystery of her birth and the conspiracy that she is inadvertently part of that goes all the way to the fucking Swedish prime minister who's a character. You're going to meet him eventually. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. And like it's this like untangling this big government conspiracy and it's not a murder mystery anymore and it's not as fun. But it's loosely tied to the Wennerstrom stuff. It's sort of the Winterstrom stuff has a look. We can't do this. It's gonna. We'll, we we'll, can't we'll take, do this. Well, we can't. We can't all we can't day explain Lord. the plots of the sequels because they're so complicated. It's, I'm just saying, it's not the dragon tattoo is so disconnected from the other two. Sure. They, I mean, but but the other thing about these two sequels is that they are Elizabeth and Mikael are not really together for pretty that's much. That's what's all annoying. Of them. Okay. And the as Fincher says, and that's even and more of a talk problem about cinematically it. than it is on it, paper. And also the yeah. other problem cinematically is it's a lot of fucking emails, like and yeah. like. You know, Fincher yeah. does so well to dramatize that, but the books are even more of like, it's like Lisbeth on her palm pilot in a hospital bed, like a lot of the time. You know, that's that's the one argument for this on paper being the bigger blank check is like Fincher signs up for this and basically the expectation is, okay, get ready to make three. And obviously yeah. the other two don't happen, but I think part of the pitch for him, I mean, as Fincher told it, he was like, I don't want to do this fucking movie. I'm not super interested in this book. Yeah. They've already adapted it well. And Rudin's wow. pitch to him is, this is your chance to make a blockbuster franchise for That wasn't Corona. Rudin. That was... Um, was that uh, Pascal? Yes. And, right. and, okay, yeah. sorry. Not Rudin. But he's just like... Rudin's fu- uh, take was, if you don't do this, I'll throw yeah. this phone at your head. Right. You Ru- fuck. Rudin's take was he pushed the polio button on his speakerphone. Do you know this, Fran, that Scott Rudin had a button on his uh, on his business phone mm-hmm. uh, where if he pressed that line, his assistants, his uh, a room full of scared assistants sure. knew it's time to bring him string cheese. Oh. <laughs> he could just have a fridge with some string no, cheese like in it in his apartment. office. And the point was he also <laughs> didn't want to waste the energy to say it, to pick up a phone and say, bring me string cheese. He just pushed the button and they go, fuck, it's line 17. Well, yeah, because it's in Polio, ele- it's in polio, elegant. polio. polio. It's inelegant to ask for string cheese, even yes. though it's protein. It was the polio line. And delicious. Do you think anyone ever, like, came in with, like, Horizon Organics and he was like, what is this shit? Polio or nothing? Yeah. Baby Bell, and he's <laughs> fucking pelting it back at their head. You don't want to give that man a baby String bell. He could make ball. a He could make a hole in you with a, with a baby don't bell. Don't give me cheese wheel. <laughs> Um, but yes, I it, mean, that's me with my dog. Do you want l- string cheese or round cheese? Like, is a question yes. I've asked her many times. Right. Well, if Baby she had a Bell button, you wouldn't have to go through all that, would you? I, mean, I can't give her, but she loves buttons. She's always well, pressing any go. button she sees. She'd love Ben. Yeah. Ben I mean, Button. She might be a little alarmed by ben him. <laughs> Why? He's a baby. Yeah. Yeah. When he looks a lot older. He looks a lot older. Um, <laughs> no, I just love that story of fin- Fincher being like, I don't know if I want to do this. And Pascal says that to him. This is your chance to make like a blockbuster franchise for adults. And he's like, God fucking damn it. 
Like it, it, the right. pitch of just. No, you're right. I mean, I mean, let's let's crack open the dossier. To do this at this scale that. with this sense of seriousness and this sense of anticipation and whatever, and part of it's like you're gonna get to do like long form storytelling. We're here to talk across about movies. The girl with the dragon tattoo. The girl with the dragon tattoo. David Fincher's 2011, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I saw it Christmas time, 2011. Mm-hmm. What about you, Fran? I saw it on New Year's Day, 2012. Sure. Sort of a memorable ring, outing, ring. but not that fun. Does it come out mm. on Christmas Day proper or like December 23rd? The film, of course, came out on December 21st. Okay, I saw it opening night. Uh, yes, I don't know if I actually saw it on Christmas Day, but it was that Christmas weekend, I remember. And I had held off on reading the books when I yep. heard Fincher was making a movie. I was like, I'll just see the movie. Same. Ben, did you see this film in theaters? I did not. Okay. I had, though, seen um, the Swedish film. Correct. It My parents were all in on these books. Right. So I knew about this franchise, but uh, I feel like... My girlfriend at the time was all in on the books, too. Humble brag. <laughs> ben, had you seen all three of the movies? Well, I, how does it line up? All three had come out before. Okay, so then, yeah, one. I had. Okay. Yeah, these, these. this was like something I would watch with my parents. My parents love... European detective and like mystery stories. They were made for parents, these yes. Nordic thrillers. Yes. yes. So this was something I could kind of get down with them. Even on. though they yeah. are brutally grim and violent often, parents right. are like, fire it up. So I hate to be that guy, but I think I even at the time was like, I'm not going to watch an American right. version. Well, well this is why Fran and I are here to talk about this, but yeah. go on. Um, go on. No, but that was a lot of the, even when the trailer yeah. came out, people were like, why do? I, why are they doing this again? Yeah. Because those movies are fucking good. They were no, so, they're not. I, they all completely are, they? are the most mid-fucking movies ever made. They're they are boring. six out of ten so boring. I only watched six. the first one. Five and a half. Yeah. Why don't you go yeah. and you look in my mother's eyes? And tell <laughs> I will. Because I just watched all three yeah. and i was like jesus like let me hit the stage David, button she needs this <laughs> yeah she needs a win there for ben's her mom, ben's fine. mom needs a win uh i watched the first one in prep for this the I first had, of the, the first ish. of the speed, speed. Speed. Yeah. 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 yeah although i no, you know what i watched the first episode of the mini series recut no i, I i'm not even doing that shit because that came later what? that's just them throwing in deleted scenes yes yeah. oh okay. they turned I it into care. six 90 minute episodes okay it adds quentin tarantino two hours yeah across the three movies yeah. well yeah. that sounds fun um okay. all right but that was uh, that was free streaming on something so i was watching that um, i watched them on topic wait that's what it was it was topic free trial I, I, did a free trial I watched on Crackle, right. and I saw yes. commercials for some of the craziest things I didn't know uh-huh. existed. Like Such Crackle. They like Crackle snap, originals. Yeah. Pop. Yep. David. Keep going. I'm done. What What did you see I ads for, well, <laughs> I'm trying. There was some medieval sitcom. Medieval set sitcom. Uh, Live action? Oh, Yeah. Um, but it has like a, I, I'm like, it's like named after guys you could fight as in Age of Empires. <laughs> I, I Googled medieval crackle sitcom and I got medieval castle room with fireplace cracking, crackling sounds on no. YouTube. This, this is, is going to drive though. me crazy. I'm like, who are some of the guys that you could play in Age of Empires? Are you playing the crackling? Maybe I should go all in on making those three hour YouTube videos that are just like, you know, it's raining outside. You're in a castle, like you know, like just mixing various vibes together. Ben's, Ben's I'm already, already doing been that. Okay. doing that. All right, then I, I won't. We step can't on have your two turf. on the same podcast. All right, what what if I take space and you take Earth? Okay, okay I, I can cool. agree we'll do to that. spaceships. Yeah, right. yeah. I so can... you're gonna um, how are you gonna record that audio? Easy, you... easy, easy. Uh, trade secret. Won't tell I you. don't remember, and I'm sure you have it in the dossier. The timeline of when the Swedish movies get released in theaters in the U.S. versus when Fincher is announced as the director of the American version. Um, I mean, I'm sure I can find the. I mean, they, the Swedish movies were released in the U.S. in 2009. Okay. Um, all three of them. The first one was released in the summer, and the others came later. They were all just released in a row, basically. And he starts filming this at the end of 2010, basically, right? He started filming this in September 2010. Yeah. So, Caustics. I think... Hmm? 
Cossacks is the name of the show. It's called Cossacks since medieval Cossacks. Sick. Yeah, it's like Jesus. it's Ukrainian peasants. This is like a really po- I, it's presumably popular crackle show. But wow. every eleven minutes and watching the Swedish girl with the dragon tattoo, I would get an ad for this. This is a bit we used to do on the George Lucas talk show. We used to mm-hmm. do. We still do it. Uh, uh, do you know who owns Crackle now? No. Chicken what company owns Crackle? Soul. Is it you guys? Chicken Soup for the Soul. We have done this on uh, the... Uh, go ahead. Oh, this makes sense with some other commercials I saw. A lot of on inspirational Crackle. content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and also something called Willie's Wonderland. Apparently chicken soup, the soup itself is not the only thing that's liquid in that fucking company because they're they're buying shit left and Very right. Good. Yeah. They're apparently Very good. The most... Success. Did you write that They're before you only, came in? No, I just, that's off the top Griffin, of the why are you reading dough. from a list that says chicken soup bits? I'm reading from the back of a Campbell's can. No, but like all these, the, we're fucking, the strike finally resolved the day the, this But the reason it took so long before. is chicken soup was the last holdout. I was gonna say there. Netflix the is like, yeah, we'll give you whatever you want. Chicken soup for the soul is like, I don't, I want to fight you on these points. No. They're lighting cigars with <laughs> yeah, fucking right. stacks of hundreds. No, they seem to be the only ones who are making money. It's not just Cossacks. It has then a totally fake tale subtitle. Oh, it does? Yeah. Well, I don't like that. Wow. Which I think is cool because it's telegraphing. <laughs> We're not taking this too seriously. I really it's hate It's very that. like Your Highness core. Hate what? Uh, like oh, sure. anything like, now you know where it's want like is your highness, mostly but based on a true story. This is based on a true story. Kind, kind of. of. Wink. And I'm like, all right. Did, you, did any of us see the last voyage of the Demeter? No. That would no. be funny if that began with. This is based on a true story. Kind of. Do you know what it does begin it with? It says like this is based on Bram Stoker's Dracula yes. chapters one to three. It does. Does like an opening card where it's like in da 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 in the seas between da 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 like it's doing all the like in universe sort of like table setting context and then the next card says based on the opening chapters of Bram Stoker's Dracula and you're like why fucking tell me this is fake because keep me in what? the reality well no the well, other thing is they're too afraid don't like, ruin the fucking they're ruining it but they're too afraid to, so they have to ruin it what's your what, what? That movie is such a good idea. I feel Incredible like idea. I feel like someone should just take another crack at it. Yeah. I'm Honestly, just annoyed. Like, yes. Just, just try again. Yeah. Try I agree. I agree. Actually, it's it's like the opposite of Girl with a Spider. I'm like, I approve a remake Do of this in one to two years. Like, well, that's it's fine. like it's doing like Natasha but this Pierre, time call it Dracula War of 1812. Yes. Like, let's keep doing this where we're just like, let's just take two chapters from this thing and I, do that. That's c- cool. Also, just fascinating that Universal is like, we learned so much from the mistake of the dark universe. We know how to handle these characters now. We're gonna release two different we're going to put them all on boats. About Dracula, neither of which are actually Dracula movies. Release them in the same year and have What's both What's the other one? Them. Renfield. Yeah, and neither oh, of Renfield, them will have the yeah. word Dracula they in the title. They did two different takes at, like, how do yes. you make a sideways Dracula movie? Well, I forgot movie. about Renfield. Well, Aquafina he didn't forget plays about a you. cop. Sure. And then they had two... A cab but Aquafina? No, A cab no, including I think Aquafina. Yeah, including, including, that character's yeah. not very good at her job. <laughs> um... The girl with the dragon tattoo, Griffin. Okay, so we all saw it, except for Ben, who is one of those fuckers sipping his tea going like, the Swedish movies are better. And that's like been a splinter in my mind for 12 years. When this movie underperformed, people said, I think it's just everyone got their fill already. I know these movies got bigger when they went on Netflix and DVD and everything. That's when I think, and I think that is true. And there was enough time in between. Yeah. Because the first one did 10 million domestically, which was a robust number for a Swedish film. Decent for a Swedish film, but no, it's all streaming. The sequels both barely made a dent in theaters. No, it's streaming. People just watch them on streaming. And, you know, it was the Cliffs Notes, too. It was like, great, I don't have to read these, like, 800-page books. I had not seen any of these. I don't know if it was out of lack of interest. I guess because the Fincher announcement didn't happen until after they had already come out and had their life cycle. But I was just like, I don't know, this isn't my kind of thing. Um... Hadn't watched until I watched the first one last night. And I just remember when the trailer for this came out and people were like, it just looks like a shot for shot remake. Why do I need to see this again? And re- watching the Swedish one for the first time, I'm like, these things don't fucking look similar at all. The Swedish I, movies I, don't look like anything. Correct. Yeah, they they look like TV. TV. Mid, yeah. They look like TV. No, I just, I, I do just want to say that when the trailer for this came out, people absolutely lost their minds because this is one oh, of the yeah. best trailers of the, movies that's what ever. I remember, Not yeah. the first teaser. I'm okay. saying the first proper trailer was when I remember dumb people uh-huh. on the internet saying it uh, looks Jesus, like a shot right. for shot remake. I was listening to my crackles. I forgot I had the volume. Uh, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess the the longer trailer, but yes. yeah, that teaser trailer with the immigrant oh, song, people were like, you know, hooting and hollering right. and feel bad movie of the yes. you know winter and all that. Yeah, no, that was the moment of like, is he about to pull off the Godfather? Like, is he taking a pulp novel and turned it right. into like? Right. Just blockbuster high art. And then this movie came out, did well, but underperformed yes. relative to its hype. And then, uh, weirdly, though, I think did the most... Did well at the Oscars, the but underperformed thing is, relative to its hype. No, it, it it did well at the Oscars compared to the underperformance. Correct. And then, you know, like, that almost suggested, like, yeah, people actually kind of dig this movie. Right. Um, and, uh, and then I think has had sort of a weird legacy... Where it took a while for people to maybe come back around and be like, you know what? Which is why I'm asking, why not just fucking make the second book set seven years later and do it now? I I think everyone might be over it, except for maybe Rooney. Yeah. Who seems like she has always loved it. I almost think this type of thing now is so much darker than what this is that this almost feels like... Yeah. Too, too easy because I remember seeing it at the time I saw it with a group of friends some of whom were like into movies and some who are not who were Humble like brag. I love a bad vibe and then we came out and we were like ah not that bad though sure. like sure and now my impression of is that everything that exists like this is is like almost so much worse and much more cruel well it's than this is and what yeah. I continue to admire about this movie every time I've like subsequently rewatched it is how gentle it is in like the margins well, it just it really cares about its uh, characters, yeah, uh, in a way that feels semi unique for this genre. Yeah. There's a sensitivity and like an empathy for its characters. Yeah, uh, it's great characters. Yeah. He wrote great characters. Old Henry, David, crack open the dossier. Henry, I oh, sorry, Henry, sorry, Henry, 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 Henry. Larson. Steeg? Compl- yeah, Steeg. Who's Henry Clarkson? Gary Larson. Of Henry the Clarkson. Larson. Henrik Larson may be a football player. The cows from the 90s, talk to yes. Each other. Henrik Larson, big football player. The cows who make pithy comments. That's Gary Larson's Millennium I, Trilogy. Cow tools. Cow tools? You know cow tools. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, Stieg Larson, yes. Yeah. So Stieg Larson, uh, Swedish. It's a crazy story to this day. Mm-hmm. Swedish writer, writes three Millennium books, the, the Millennium Trilogy. Yeah. Uh, submits them, dies of a heart attack before any of them are published, mm-hmm. and then posthumously they become gigantic bestsellers. Are there like conspiracies about his death? I don't think so. They're just he like, was he an died. unhealthy man. Okay, like not in a terrible way or anything. But well, like, you know, he, his books are about conspiracy, and then he died. It's like yeah. you'd think maybe people would be like, the man who ate poorly. Yeah, I mean, like <laughs> the man who obvi- abused cigarettes. You know, Mikael Blomqvist is obviously Stieg Larsson, like very. Um, yeah, the hottest guy who's ever gone on computer. No, the whole point, especially in the books, is it's yeah. like, you know, he's like, yeah, I work at this magazine. I'm kind of whatever. And every woman, including like Secret Service agents in the sequels, is like, do you want to fuck me forever? Like, can we just like continue? It's like, really funny. A, an early insight in the commentary where you're just like, oh, Fincher just got how to do this. Mm-hmm. Is he was like, my big take on this character is that he's kind of a bimbo. That and that's the totally, thing, yeah. which Before is the huge shift the books, from watching the Swedish version, yeah. where it's like I mean, kind, I think he's great. In he's those. great actor. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the yeah. characterization but is so much better in this. Of like, he doesn't understand that he's a little glib. Which, but the, that's and Fran. We read the books, at least the first. We, yeah. we both. I really think that is what he's like in the books. He's so chill. Mm. And so, like, hey man, whatever. That yeah, like, he's just got a that's great. That's why he's attractive. Yeah, he's got a great vibe. But yeah. that's like sort of the old classic journalist vibe of like a guy who can get into any room. Who's good at listening. Yes. Talk to anyone. Exactly. Listen to anyone. I don't think Nyquist is charming enough I in agree. the Swedish he's movies. And I grumpy. love him. Yeah, he's I love giving him a too. more dramatic But he's yeah. he's not sort of playing with like charisma. Yes. He's like taking being a journalist too seriously. Craig is on the right line of that. Also, this is Completely. one of the hottest okay. Eminem's ever. Well, okay. it's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so I agree. And Forky... <laughs> who was kind of like, uh, I don't know if I want to watch this. Yeah. I know it has, like, multiple scenes of sexual assault. It's long. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll kind of, you know, I'll, I'll let you know when you might want to, like, go get, some, you know, tea yeah. or whatever. But then she's just like, Daniel Craig has never looked better. And I kind of agree. Yeah. Yeah. Like, sort of, so like, more rumpled, sleepy Daniel Craig with glasses and a sweater is weirdly hotter than James Bond. Look, and this is another classic Griff Hetero cancel me opinion. Oh, boy, here we go. What? But Daniel Craig is often a guy where I'm like, he's kind of goofy looking. I don't get him being a sex symbol. And I mm. watch this and I'm like, most handsome man in the world. It's like when I saw a fucking, what's it called, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. 
And uh-huh. I said to you, like, Matthew Reese is exactly how I'd like to look in my mind. And you were like, that guy, he's got, like, a black eye for half the movie. <laughs> sure, he looks pretty beat up in that movie. No, There's he's so hot. He's a handsome actors looking kind of exquisitely haggard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which mm-hmm. Craig's just at the right balance well, of everything in the this. The appeal of Craig is that he doesn't look like he's had a ton of work done. Like no. he's he's aging like real people he's age. He's a real fella. Yes. It's true. That's a good point. And he's got a real face. And he was, you know, he was handsome yeah. prior to that, but he just has like a handsome older face kind of starting with this movie and he going was, forward. Look, yeah. very pretty when he was young, mm-hmm. but when he's young, it's a little intense. Well, and also his eyes when he's young, say. it's too intense. Like it seems like there's an old person trapped inside this right. young body. Yes. This is sort of the same thing with Viggo Mortensen, yeah. I think, where mm. when I yeah. watched Who- Por- Portrait of a Lady... Yeah, sure. in prep for when sure. I came he was a Campion, very pretty man like, in the nineties. Like, I don't want to see him. Yeah, 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 like this. I need to see him. And, and, he, and it's like he's he, got this western this year that he directed. That he's also Vico. in with Creeps. Vico with okay. Creeps with Creeps. Creeps, 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 creeps. riding creeps. around on a horse. <laughs> yeah, called the Dead Don't Hurt. I think it's like Good. some you know Great. right. It's like someone rolled a dice yeah. on western titles. Yeah. <laughs> it was like yeah, Dead Don't Give Hurt. Give me cool. fifteen tickets. And I didn't see it. It was a tiff. But everyone walking out, I was like, how is it? They're like, oh, you know, it's okay. It's not bad. Vico's so hot in it. Yeah. And I'm like, damn, Vico's just still collecting that. But similar thing where it's like Vigo becomes hotter if he obscures his hotness a little bit. Totally. When you look at Vigo and he's just like really young and really clean cut, you're like something about this is like staring into the sun. Yeah. And then it's like grow out the facial hair a little bit. Do something weird to yourself. Right. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, Craig in this is. It's crazy. Looks he's a babe. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know. And he works in media. He does. Independent media. A hot person in independent media. Yeah. He's, That's crazy. I'm looking at one right I, now. I know. He's keeping know. the industry afloat with his with his bare hands. He's mm-hmm. fucking putting it right on his shoulders. This is what I'm always telling the staff at Fran Magazine. It would be funny if, and everyone should subscribe to Fran Magazine. Everyone I'll just put that right up top. No, whatever. They no, should. No. <laughs> they I don't should. Even care anymore. Yeah, I see. They should. I care. Yeah. Um, but it would be funny if the trilogy ends with him being like, I think I will start a Substack. <laughs> yeah. Um, not that he has a Swedish well, accent in this movie. That uh, would make more sense in the book, but we can talk about the end of the book. Sure. When we talk about the end of the movie. David. Yeah. I'm notoriously great at falling asleep. Good job. The best at it. Yep. No problems there. Do it at reasonable hours. I stay asleep. I wake up at good hours. Uh huh. I need no help. You're describing good sleep. Right. I'm, I'm the best at it. If I can say. I am the best at sleeping. Great. Okay. So are we done? Well. What's up? You got a little baby. I do. You have a daughter. I'm a toddler now. I'm yes. a toddler. Uh, I've heard some stories about uh, sleep training being difficult. Well, there's that, but also. Changing um, your hours. Look, look. Yes. Well, yes, that's true. You sleep, you change your own sleep patterns as sure. well as prioritize a, a, a small things mm-hmm. sleep, which uh, is difficult to deal with. And, you know, when babies are born, mm-hmm. uh, they really crave white noise, supposedly, because, you know, when they were in the womb, they were hearing a lot of white noise all the time. It's comforting sure. to them. They're that's the concept. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. They're big Michael Keaton fans. Sure. <laughs> Deborah Care Unger. Uh-huh. Um, and so when I had a kid, I got a hatch, you know, white noise machine mm-hmm. uh, for my daughter. That was the that was the first thing I got. Okay. I believe it was the uh, hatch rest. Um, but now I also have a hatch restore, which is like a sort of uh, combo white noise machine and like clock. Okay. With a sunlight alarm. You know, you can do the 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 slow, bright. David, I'm going to blow your mind. You will not believe the coincidence. What's up? Our sponsor day happens to be Hatch. I know ah! you organically were just saying this. I mean, okay, yeah. That you happen to purchase and enjoy several Hatch products that you've used regularly for yep. the last two years. Yep. And we never do tangents on the show. We never so do tangents, but weird. in fact, they happen to be the sponsor. And you, my friend, have stumbled into an ad read. Um, well, think of the Hatch Restore 2 okay. as your bedside sleep guide, Griffin. Your ally in rest. Okay. Okay. The innovative all-in-one dream machine is a sophisticated sound machine, light, and alarm clock, beautifully designed for your bedside table. You said innovative in a very British way. Innovative. Good rest allows you to be the best version of yourself, which is why the Hatch Restore 2 was engineered to help you form healthy sleep habits for life. Um, you know, so you got the light coming on slowly mm. to sort of train your body to knowing when it's time to rise. Uh, you can use it to coach you through meditations or mindfulness exercises uh-huh. if you want. Um, you can listen to white, pink, or brown noise. Wow. And they've got a lot of nature sounds. They got rain, you know, they got hey. waves, they got all that stuff. 
Um, I love the Hatch machines. I have used them consistently for the last two and a half years. And right now, Hatch is offering our listeners $20 off your purchase of a Hatch Restore 2 and free shipping at what? Hatch. Dot co slash check sleep deeply and wake gently with the restore to go to hatch.co slash check to get twenty dollars off and free shipping that's hatch.co slash check um but uh yes obviously and let's talk about i'll crack open the dossier now crack but just completely dossier. iconic that rooney mara is like i'm piercing my nipples i'm like changing my hair mm-hmm. i'm going to learn a swedish accent and daniel craig is like i was thinking I wear some glasses, and that's the end of the work I do on this character, and it fits his character so well. I remember when I saw the trailer, I went, oh, smart. Daniel Craig's character has been made British, so they <laughs> sure, right. justify why all the other Swedish characters are speaking in English throughout the rest of the movie. <laughs> it's like, hi, I'm Mikhail Bunkus. Right, do I, you want to fill bagel? <laughs> I was like, that's actually smart of them. You could have him be like, I'm half Swedish, but I was raised in England or whatever. Like one fucking line at the beginning well, of the movie. And then I watch it and I'm like, oh, he's meant to be Swedish. And they're all just speaking English, yeah. which is a classic yeah. movie thing. But yeah. for Fincher felt like a little bit of a cheat. I think maybe it's canonical so. that he went to school in London, though. Interesting. Everyone in Sweden speaks literally perfect English, too. Maybe not. Like, I mean, not, I mean, come at me, Swedes, but my friend lives in Sweden now. And like, I think, you know, they're, they're very intelligent and they all learn English. I just had to physically restrain myself from doing the England bit. You bastard. I for, I don't know what you're talking about. You went to uni. So look, look, look. It's like hurting me. I was, just, I was dossier, there. Dossier, I should dossier, say dossier, like the social, I was in England in. seeing the dossier, social dossier, network. Do, quickly, all right, quickly. hush. The social network comes out. Just a little more than a year before this film, obviously. Right. Uh, September 2010. Rooney is has, when that has been its festival cast debut. when this movie is. Sure. But look, so, so Fincher when, when really Social Network's released. Fincher doesn't really have any other projects, obviously, on the line in between these two, except for he was briefly rumored to be directing Pawn Sacrifice. Yes. Uh, but he says, no, I was never going to do that. I just, like, helped out with some, like, consulting on the script or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also... In between Social Network and Dragon Tattoo starts developing Mind Hunter with Charlize Theron. Yes. Who is a producer. Was she supposed to be in it I at that point? I believe she was supposed to play okay. the Anator part at and some point. And it was going to be an HBO limited Correct. Thing. It was going to be on an HBO. Yes. Right. Um, and that would have been better. But, mm. you know, what can I say? Uh, 2005, of course. Men Who Hate Women. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stieg Larsson's first novel. Uh, he dies at the age of 50. It is young. He died of a heart attack. Yeah. I'm, I now or feel bad else. that I was like, he was unhealthy. Like, like no, I know fucking Steve like, Larson's they, workout they got routine. It. He got got. The podcast co-host who throws shade. Um, <laughs> like, I don't, you know, but obviously it was a, tra- a tragic and young death. And mm-hmm. it's it, if you want to Google him, it's a crazy story where his girlfriend says, like, I have more books that he's written outlines but I'll never release them because I don't I don't get any of the money because like of Swedish will laws uh-huh. and like his parents get the money and he hated his parents and you know then the parents sold the rights and someone else has written these sequels. It's a crazy thing. But well, they weren't based off the outlines or they were No, they weren't. Okay. No. Those outlines have never been seen. And she still has them. She still has them. That's she wrote why. a book about like her life with him and you know yeah. like anyway. Um, she wrote a book that's like, man, these outlines are so fucking good. If, juicy. Any, if anyone in the government wants to change some laws. <laughs> um so uh, that novel uh, comes out in America and England and so on uh, in 2008. Okay. Uh, and the uh, two sequels come out in 2009, and it all explodes I was very quickly. Say, the book explodes, like, immediately, yes. right? Um, Kathleen Kennedy, uh, who is working with Fincher on Benjamin Button, hands Fincher the book pretty much the minute it's translated into yeah. English. Uh, he reads it, and as he says, he's like, it's 500 pages. It's about a bisexual motorcycle hacker in in Stockholm fighting Nazis. Sure. I will never get to make this movie. I right. am not rolling another ball up a hill. Like, yes. I don't want to. Right. Um, and so, uh, lesbian hacker on a motorcycle, I don't think so. That's mm-hmm. his quote to okay. Entertainment <laughs> Weekly. Um, eventually, uh, Sony picks it up, Amy mm-hmm. Pascal. Uh, and our, our favorite chill uh, cheese string friend, Scott Rudin. Polly uh, out! Rudin brings on Steven Salian, a sort of heavyweight uh, screenwriter, mm-hmm. obviously, who had just worked on Moneyball. But this is just like all Sony Pictures A-team. Exactly. Right. right. We're putting our best on it. And their number one choice is David Fincher for mm-hmm. very obvious reasons. Like, it's like it very clear why they would think he'd be good for this. Yeah, you also imagine they're like, man, social network's fucking shaping up well. We want to stay in the Fincher business. This guy's holding a hot hand right now. Steven Zalian was the first choice to adapt The Silence of the Lambs, and his wife had told him, don't do it, that book's fucked up. Yeah. 
and he always regretted it. Mm-hmm. And so when this book came up, his wife apparently was like, don't listen to me. Like, Be a fucking freak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should do the darkest shit imaginable. Yeah. He had his Ben Hosley dang-ass freak shirt on. <laughs> um, uh, and yes, as you say, it's Amy Pascal who pitches Fincher on this idea of like, this is a franchise for adults. Right. Like, there's no chance at making a movie franchise that doesn't have to be for 11-year-olds outside of something like this. Yes. And Fincher really does like that idea. Wild to The think. only chance for something like the dragon tattoo to be made in all of its perversions yes. is to do it big, as he says. It's and The wild. Godfather is what he yeah. compares it to. It's wild to think that that's her pitch, and he's like, you're right, things are so dire out there that this is the one way that a movie like this gets made, a franchise like this gets made. And they're saying that in 2010. Right. Yeah. Two years before the Avengers comes out. Dun, dun, dun. What dun, dun, dun. movie is it that she's like, people don't want to see affairs anymore? That's the big Amy Pascal. Aloha. Movie. Aloha. Thank you. Another blank check classic. Yeah. She said, I, yeah. I, I, when will I learn this lesson? People never want to watch movies about affairs. Which yeah. is an interesting point I think by about her, this all the time. When I read yeah. Aloha, I'm not like, you know what's wrong with this movie? It has an affair in it. Have I <laughs> said on Mike that I've gotten Aloha pill? <laughs> I mean, you were flirting it with it all the way never back not then. Implied yeah. you are I was flirting built. with it, but but also thought it was fundamentally broken. And then I rewatched it in a hotel, and I was like, "Is this like a straight up masterpiece?" Now and bought on Blu-ray and watched all the alternate ending and opening, and I think it kind of rules now. Uh, I'll, I'll check it out. It's about the sky. Also, is a thing I'm, I cracked. I recently. am aware. I of cracked that. that recently. That's a new take. Oh, that's new. We didn't say that on the episode. Never, not one time. You seen Aloha? No. It means hello and goodbye. Yeah. Mm, like shalom. Yes. They should have made a sequel. Sort of Mother's Day, New Year's Year's Eve did. (laughs) Salutations that are also farewells. Emma Stone could play Jewish. Why not? It's it's Maestro, no? Bradley Cooper? No. Yes, no, it's Bradley. Yeah, it's Maestro. Okay, okay. Uh, But he has a weird foot instead of a weird nose. He's got an extra toe. (laughs) Is that true? Yeah. yeah, or okay. his toes injured by the war or something? He was in a... a Which war? Mine. There was a mine incident. Um, it's a good question. They <laughs> sewed <laughs> someone else's the toe onto war? his foot. He has someone else's toe sewed onto his foot. I okay, think. Which Whatever. war is it? Bosnia? Iraq? I cannot remember. Afghanistan? I don't know. Um, so, Zellian is like, okay, I didn't watch the Swedish movie because I didn't want that to mess with me. Mm-hmm. Um, I really love the book, but basically the big problem is just what do you remove? Yeah. I think this is an excellent piece of adaptation that does not really, like, skip anything major. Like, it feels like a very good abridgment abridgment of the book. Yes. I think I prefer the end of the book, actually. Interesting. But... I mean, they have... This and the book have the same ending. Basically. Basically. Like, you know, which is Lisbeth allowing herself to feel something... Well, there's and also then getting hurt, you know, like Blomquist without is like, confronting him. I'm going to publish about what happened here. Yes. Yeah. And Wenger is like, <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah, that That's all cut out of the movie. Which I just think is this, th- like the thing that sort of turns him against is him being like, well, I don't really have good stuff for you on yeah. the Wennerstrom thing. And I can't let you publish about this because like I have to keep my business afloat. So yeah. actually no one should ever know about this right. in a way that wow. makes poisons their relationship yeah. in a, I think, much more poignant way right this movie just ends with like i mean i understand that like but it's like I'm there not was miss- only so I'm much they could that. do right i'm just like, like yeah. that's in that kind of coda section yeah but what's interesting yeah, about the movie th- like a 30 minute it's coda. Long. Yeah. it ends on so much more of an emotional character note than a plot note which that is ends in the up, book too obviously, sure the reunion but but, yeah. but putting the emphasis on that weirdly makes you more eager to see the sequel i find than even if what you're saying sets up a sequel well I find the place these two characters are in relative to each other at the end of the movie so affecting that I'm like, I want to fucking watch more of them. Um, well, he's Henrik Wenger is not really in the sequels at all, but Harriet is. Okay. And is like in charge of Millennium. Yeah. The magazine. And you'll never believe who she's sleeping with. I, who? I don't know. Okay. Okay. You have to guess. Okay. There's one person who everyone's sleeping with in the Millennium trilogy. I'll tell you that much. Um, but, uh, like, literally, there's a secret agent in one of the sequels who's uh-huh. like, I think I'm going to fuck you. And I'm like, I wanted to go into the book and be like, your job is definitely to not fuck this man. Yeah. Like, you are working for Swedish Secret Service. Like, you probably shouldn't do this. Uh, She's like, ah, he's kind of hot, though, even though he's, like, fucking four other people. Things Fincher said on the commentary about adapting this with Zalian is that they were, like, trying so hard to figure out how to fit it into 
a three act structure. Yes. Because of how oddly shaped the book is. Right. And it's how two is parallel stories that don't meet for half the right. book. Yes. Right. They do not meet until one hour it's, and one fifteen minutes. It, it's halfway. One hour and one. It's the halfway mark. Yeah. One hour and fifteen minutes into a movie that's an hour, two and a half, basically. Um, he said there was just the point where he and Zalen kept on trying to squeeze it in, and it just went like, "We just need to accept this as a five act story." Which is unconventional, but if they're ever going to let us do it, they're going to let us do it on this movie. Uh, and he said once they did that, it adapted very cleanly. Um, right. And that is exactly it what they do, It feels smoother right? than the... I'm, I'm not going to rag on the Swedish version, but it feels smoother the, in that the Swedish one is almost so one-to-one that it has no act structure. It just feels like sure. transposing. A Wikipedia entry movie. Yeah. yeah. That is how the... yeah. The, Whereas the, it feels like genuinely dramatic when, but when he shows up at Lisbeth's door in this. It's also just like, I, I don't know how to define how this movie pulls it off, but somehow the hour and 15 minutes leading up to them finally meeting in person feels like it is loaded with tension as if it's like Brody coming face to face with the shark, finally, right? Right. Where you just feel the force of this movie like slowly pulling these two people together rather than it like having to trudge along to the exciting part. Yeah. Um. Of course, they have to kind of front the fact that a lot of this this movie has a lot of rape in it, uh, and you know, sort of like very very difficult uh, mm-hmm. material. And it, all, all, honestly, almost all of that material is more crucial for the sequels. Like, if you're watching this movie, you're kind of like, why do I even need to see this whole plot about Lisbeth and her caretaker that mm-hmm. doesn't resolve? And it's like, well, that actually all is crucial to the sequels. But I think it is also just pivotal to the mindset she's in yes. when she meets. Um, Mikkel, obviously, and he yeah. says, I want you to help me catch a killer of women. Mm-hmm. And she looks at him and it looks like the she's it's, it's like she's looking That's through you and yeah. you know, you fucking shiver, and it's so good. Uh Fincher though also says, like, uh, I wanted this material to be very offensive. Rape in movies shouldn't be tiddling, it should be offensive. It's the power of clockwork orange, it's revolting. Mm-hmm. I uh, wholly respect Straw Dogs or even Star 80. There are moments in that movie that just completely challenge your ideas of revenge. Just wanted to note that he mentioned Star 80. Sure. Well, he loves Fosse. All that jazz is like a recurring influence he always cites. Um, but yes, like uh, the point is to put that subject matter in proper, proper, perspective, proper perspective, which for me relates to both her subjugation and the inhumane treatment that she suffers at the hands of this man, her retribution. I don't want to see people cheering, which you don't really. No. Because it's so bleak and nightmarish, even when she's like, you know, getting her revenge. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, yeah, uh, Niels Arden Oplev, who made the Swedish movie, says, uh, like, uh, you know, he wasn't worried. Everyone who loves film will go see the original. He said, what would you want to see, the French version of La Femme Nikita or the American one? Go off, bro. Uh-huh. Like, if I heard Fincher was remaking a movie I just did, I, I might, like, be like, oh, shit. Like, yeah, oh boy, <laughs> but whatever. That's a bit of a like a Scorsese Infernal Affairs thing where you're just like, look, if that guy wants to take a crack at it, who am I to stand in the way? Um, yeah. Uh, Rooney Mara. Okay, so the casting of this film. Big story. Daniel Craig, obviously. Hey, Daniel Craig, will you do this? Sure, let's just work out the schedule. The rumor Click. was that he wanted Brad Pitt originally. I guess. I don't know. The, the way they talk about it is But then that it that basically was, was Craig. Deal. He meets yeah. with Craig uh, to try to convince him to take the role while yeah. filming Tintin. Uh, right. This Thanks. is... Craig had not been in a movie for three years that it was in theaters. Yes. And then this year he has Tintin, this, Defiance is this year, and there's okay. uh, Cowboys and Aliens, right? Yeah, Sky Falls oh, the yeah. following year. Yeah, spring, yes. summer 2012. Sky Fell the following year. Or this, fall 2012. This was that, there was some Bond rights issue that held up the run between those two movies. There was a bit of a Bond When's nonsense. Quantum, 2009? Quantum's 08? I'm sorry, Defiance is in 08. Uh, Quantum's in 08. Yes. Uh, 2011, the four are Cowboys and Aliens, Tintin, Dragon Tattoo, and Dreamhouse, which I believe was maybe a delayed movie. Dreamhouse? That's that where the Jim Sheridan movie where meets he meets Rachel, Rachel Vice. He built his own Dreamhouse off of that movie. I love that. Family is a real home. Is, Dream, is this like a Stephen King thing? No, no it's like a horror. That's Dreamcatcher. It's like a sort of yes. horror thriller movie. It's like a Stephen King movie not based on a Stephen King book. I understand. Um... But yeah, no, he, uh, Fincher goes to meet him on the set of Tintin and he's wearing like the blue onesie pajamas. Uh, mm-hmm. sure. With, uh, with a cowboy, uh, with a pirate hat on his head. He just took the cowboy hat him. off his head, obviously, because yes. he was yes. fighting the aliens. Red Rackham's trailer. Uh, treasure. treasure. Jesus well fucking Christ. Uh, but yes, 
Craig, I think, smartly, even though every top actress in Hollywood is fighting for this role, I think Fincher knows I got to get an A-lister to play Blomqvist so I have a little more latitude on Lisbeth. Uh, and it was such an extended casting search. It was, like, the most extreme. I feel like the press at the time was like, this I is... I think it had been a while also since the trades had gotten to do that. The sort yes. of, like, you know, this is the hottest role in a decade. Like, every young ingenue wants it. It's a Scarlett O'Hara, like, fucking Gone with the Wind shit. And I think even, like, when we get this sort of hullabaloo about, like, superhero casting, it's like, yeah, but this is, like, the fifth person to play this part who gives right. a shit. Right. You know, versus this being, like, first American crack at it. The New Mirror Pace thing was casting a bit of a shadow. But every person's up for it. And Fincher just, like, defined it so well. There's so many quotes he has about why he cast Rooney Mara that have, like, lingered with me for years. But on the commentary, he said that, like, Sony did not want Rooney Mara. And he had to say to them, I want the last puppy in the window. Like, that is the most fundamental quality we're looking for, is someone who cannot be discouraged. And it, 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 regardless... It, Someone who cannot be discouraged and who is getting no encouragement. If someone I is too I love tapped last puppy for this in the window, role, that's yes. really clever. Yes. But he was like, something fundamental to the casting of this part is someone who would have to fight to get this part and who no one yeah. could see I, playing this part. I mean, he says he required some convincing because he was initially like, you know, you're Erica Albright. Yes. I still have you in that, you know, mode in my brain. Yes. Like, I, and she had to convince him a little bit. She, she kind of outlasted everyone, though. And right. She also yeah. has this whole story of, like, I wasn't even sure I wanted to go in for it. And then I, she says, I saw some of the names up for the part, and I was like, if though they're going in, I should go in for it. I'm I'm as right for it as anyone else. Like, yeah. Uh, but he was like, they, she did five separate screen tests. Not even right. just, like, auditions, but, like, proper screen tests. And two of them were in the Batman suit, which is weird. Just put it on. Always the Kilmer suit. Everyone auditions wearing the Kilmer suit for every project. Um, but he was like, almost, even before the point where he's trying to convince Sony to cast her, he's almost trying to talk himself out of casting her. Because, yes, out of his experience with her, he was like, she's not right for this. And he'd like, test her on a specific thing and be like, this is the thing I need to see out of you. And he was like, every time I said new hurdle, she jumped over the hurdle without hesitation. Until it became so clear that she was the only person. Do you yeah. want to read off the I mean, so many names list? are connected. Emily yeah. Browning, Eve, Ava Green. Some of them are like Anne Hathaway, Scarlett Johansson. You're like, I, no. sure, you know. Joe Hansen sh did by she all did accounts. She did a test, yeah. But like, I mean, Fincher cites her as she was so wrong. That was the example. Right. right. He even, uh, beyond Kira that, he Knightley. was like, she was actually incredibly good. Right. Her audition he says was incredibly she good. she did a great job, right. You're never going to get past the fact that she's Scarlett Johansson. It's another one of these quotes I think about where he's like, the thing about casting Rooney Mara is she's like very beautiful, but also she's a little bit like E.T. He was like, E.T. was the example I kept on making to the studio of like, he if E.T. E. merchandise was on the shelves before the movie came out, people would be like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> but basically, here, the movie, I, I can read you the yeah, quote. Please. What is this little squishy thing? Uh, but then, yes, after you see the movie, you're like, you know, he hides under the table. And he grabs the Reese's Pieces. You love him. Like, right. yes, he looks like an ugly little creature before you see E.T. And after yeah. you see E.T., you're like, I need an E.T. in my life. And he basically was just like, there is no way to not make Scarlett Johansson titillating. And like th uh, some of these other names, too, like Anne Hathaway or Jennifer Lawrence or Natalie Portman. Or, and like these are, you know, totally. I also just don't buy some of those names. The supposed final four. Yeah are Rooney Mara, Lea Seydoux, which uh -huh. is sort of... The final four makes perfect sense. Pre-Blue pre, um, is the warmest color. Yes. Sarah Snook. Yes. Good call. Oh, like, yeah. ahead of the curve. 100%. And uh, Sophie Lowe, who's a, a like an Australian I've actress I don't liked. know very yeah. well. She's good. Um, what do you know her from? I don't know. Looks she's like she's done a lot stuff. of Australian stuff. Yeah. Um, she's done a lot of American stuff, too. Um, okay. The the thing, uh, the Scarlett Johansson thing about her being like fundamentally wrong, the proof that she's wrong for this part is uh, uh, under the skin, right? Uh, yeah, because yeah, you're yeah. like that's a movie premised on even if Scarlett Johansson acts like a sociopathic alien, everyone in the world wants yeah, to. She's sleep a walking yeah. honey trap. That's the point, right? Yeah, right. yeah. She's she's always best when I think like in conversation with her star persona totally. in something, which is why she's so good in like Asteroid City uh, or yeah, whatever. True of, of or like Hail Caesar. Yeah, 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 yeah. But this, like you but need someone who... Doesn't who, have that. Right. 
I th- I always think when there are these big sort of like casting things, the last of which I can really remember being that significant was like the Elvis casting. Sure. Where the person you pick, you're just like, uh, okay. Yeah. And that winds up having the most room for surprise and I well, think success. Also. What I always like when it's just like, fuck, this like audition must be something really special. Yeah. yeah usually when, right, when they cast someone you don't know very well, you're like, clearly they're incredible. Like, yes. because why else would he be beating out, you know? Whatever, Miles Teller. The other thing, I don't know if it's in the dossier, the but I think are. about this a lot because I think it's one of the greatest definitions of like uh, uh, what you look for in casting, right? Where Fincher was like, um, a lot of a lot of these actresses, especially like the bigger names on this list, came in and like gave really good performances, but they were performances. They were like constructions, right? Mm-hmm. And I believe very strongly in like filmmaking is really tedious. And long, my movies are longer and more tedious than most. You know, I'm paraphrasing here, but like, I'm going to do a million takes of people. We're going to be filming at like four o'clock in the morning in like the freezing, like Nordic weather. You need to cast someone where there is some fundamental quality within them that is unbeatable, that will be in their system no matter what at all times of the day. Because you need the thing that even when they're just depleted is going to come across on camera. And he was just like, she had whatever that weird alien energy was, where it's like, as much as this is a performance and a construction, that wasn't an affectation. And so I just knew no matter what, if I put the camera in front of her, that's going to come across, right. which is such a smart explanation of like, you need to identify what the fundamental quality is that that person is innately projecting, whether conscious or not, that is always going to be there no matter what in every single take. It's yeah. interesting the way that this sort of sets the tone for the rest of the stuff that she winds up doing over the yeah. course of the next decade, such that now I think Social Network feels like kind of the anomaly. Totally. Where it's like, okay, so then she's just normal in this one? Yeah. Um, Like this even, like, you know, famously she like, you know, gets a bunch of the piercings and bleaches her eyebrows for this. But I think it also like fundamentally changed her look as a celebrity where she's yes. got this kind of weird, like, gothic thing since then. Yeah. That she's only continued to, like, pursue. And but then I don't know to what extent that was sort of under the surface. Yeah. Or if this, like, awoke that in her. Well, yeah, but it's like, right, she didn't think she was right for it. He didn't think she was right for it. And somewhere along the way, there was just some frequency there that both of them tapped into. And he was also just like, the more we tested her, it felt like she had the best understanding of this character of anyone like talking to her across the audition process, no one seemed as kind of like latched on to what was mm-hmm. going on. Um. So, okay, yeah, you know, a lot of this Rooney Mara stuff, like it, the interview magazine profile where she, they're talking about how she like beat someone up, like who accosted her and like, you know, I don't, there's a lot of weird shit around it that I am honestly a little tired by. I feel like the hype drowned this movie a little bit Absolutely. right you know like the sort of pre-casting all that stuff but yes she went crazy method she learned how right. to go on the internet she went to google.com and yes. with google crime yes and then she could find all of the world's crimes and Fincher went don't go too deep you um, need to be able to come back from this character obviously her run basically from like social network to carol mm-hmm. is pretty strong yes and then since then I have you know felt a little like she's uh, worked less the last five. She made a lot of movies in the last five you know years. No, she's so good. Maybe in... not in the last five years, but since Carol. After after Carol, what? she's so good as a voice in Kubo and the she, two strings. She is very, very good. That in is Kubo. like a crazy voice performance. Yes. I, like, I like that's why I, like I regret the entire not all white voice cast of Kubo. Wow, well, yes. really? Good. They're all really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she plays like multiple because her character is she like, plays like two, uh, yeah. two characters. Yeah. Yes, uh, Karasu Pan? and Washi. My, my yeah, Pan. that's the thing. It's like yeah. post Carol. It's like Pan Lion, uh, the oh. Discovery. I'm the one guy who likes Lion. Lion again? Is that the Dev, Dev Patel? Patel okay. yeah. Lion's not bad, but I think that's, that movie's pretty good. That's one of those, like, Rooney Mara, do you not know that you don't need to take this part? Yeah, you don't yeah, have to be the, the girlfriend. Like that. Her role is thankless in that. That's true. That movie's, I think, okay. Yeah. I uh, like it. Yeah, Whatever. It's, 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 you know, Ghost Story, I think, you know, she's good in it, but obviously it's sort of a... She's incredibly good in Ghost Story. Yeah. Sure. She eats the pie. I've I think, she, pie I think that's the start of her as, in what I call, Wounded Bird. Like... Where I'm like, can right. you do anything? I say that as a compliment. 
Scared bird is famously my description. Yeah, bird, Women yeah. I find attractive. Don't yeah. woman, don't worry, he wouldn't get far on foot. You know, Mary Magdalene, obviously that doesn't sure. really work out. Nightmare Works Alley. Out a personal life. Well, sure. Then mm-hmm. I'm happy for her. A happy home. Did you see Mary Magdalene? No one. No one's no seen one saw, them. No right? No one saw it. No. No. Well, you see stuff. <laughs> well, so thank you so much. But no, yeah. I did not see Mary Magdalene. Uh, no, Nightmare Alley, where I'm like, man who Rooney's back, and then you watch Nightmare Alley, and you're like, I, I tr- Rooney had the worst role. Yeah. I don't even remember who she is in that. She's the like his love interest for the first half of she's the movie. She's the slept on kind of like she's nice the girl lightning girl. Kindness is sort of taken advantage. I, I right. really only remember Blanchett in that. Well, because Blanchett shows up and is yeah. like, and all like, right, okay, Carol, I guess get the out movie. of here. She basically, the second half <laughs> the of the movie started. becomes his ignored wife while he yeah. falls in love with Blanchett. And then uh, I do think she's good in woman talking, but I also think she's kind of, women talking. but I think she kind of has like the, the most sort of like functional role in it in sure. a way. I never that, saw like, it. So a lot of the, you know, I'm supporting the cast well, get to have more fun. Friend, maybe I didn't think they should step back and listen. I didn't think they should talk. Why don't you sit your ass down on a bale of hay just like the rest of them do in Time that movie? What is she table. arguing on? Is she like, we should go or we should She's leave? the sort of leader, yeah, being she, like, we need to go. Her argument is basically, yeah, we should talk. She's pro talk. Yeah, right, right. She's, She's like, let's start talking. She's, She's like, like, voice, like, I don't want to. And also, it's weird that we were both Elizabeth Salander. Yeah. Uh, She's blonde. Jesse Buckley's like, can I get a shot? I just she's see through in that movie because that movie is <laughs> well, not yeah. black and white, but they color grade it so extremely. The, yeah, Zack Snyder flashback of that movie is not kind to Rooney Mara in particular. It is unfair. I don't think it's kind to any of them. No, but it's worse for her yeah, because yeah, yeah. she already is made out of rice paper. Um, she's made out of wet napkins. She really is. That's <laughs> well put. Um, but obviously that suits Dragon Tattoo so well because yes. the whole point of Lisbeth is you're like, ooh, is this a ghost yeah. that just walked through? But then also she might taser you. Yeah. You know, uh, she's she's a wiry little... Yeah, she know, rules in that. Uh, she's so good. It's so great. Good. Uh, they shoot... Uh, yeah, Daniel Craig, you know, he's James Bond. You may have heard of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, he'd had a busy 2008... And he has a busy 2011. They have to sort of fit him in Mm -hmm. around this movie and around cowboys and aliens and all that. uh, And Tintin and all that shit. Uh, Tintin and all that shit. Love Tintin. Root to Tintin. Tintin, another movie that's another 2011 movie where I'm like, where's my sequel? Yep. Um, Maybe combine the two. uh, The reporter with the flipped up hair. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Maybe that's how you get around the reporter with the white dog. You you replace. Oh, I thought you were going to say Rooney aging as you just make her. Either or, but I like the idea of Lisbeth and Tintin teaming up. Mm-hmm. Just okay. mush mush the books together. May I? It's kill sort him? of like a pan European yeah. thing. It could be good yes. for that continent. Yes. to have that. Right, and it's half mocap and half right. real. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Craig says that David Fincher made him start like drinking wine and eating pasta because right. he was like, you don't, you look too much like an action hero. Yeah. You have to look like a journalist. Um. Uh, Craig said, like, I just, the minute I tried the Swedish accent, I was like, sounds dreadful. Can I just have my regular accent? And Fincher was like, fine. Mm -hmm. Um, which again, if I'm Rooney Mara, I'm like scratching at my nipple piercing and I'm like, oh, it's fine for him to just uh, do (laughs) that. Okay. Well, all right. Yeah. Uh, they shot this movie for, I believe seven months. Um, yeah, they started in September and they weren't done till April. The thing, um, but Fincher says part of that is because Sweden made them work slow because you only do eight hours a day by labor law in Sweden. Okay. Uh, he liked working in Sweden in a lot of ways because he says the crew can be different. Yeah. Like there's less union rules about like you know people can do multifunctional things. Sure. But he's like, we were just, and he was like, and I insisted we do Sweden because I didn't want like Montreal to be playing Good Sweden. Call. Like yeah. yeah. Uh, the thing that came up in the commentary a lot, and I've been trying to watch most of these movies with commentaries. He does Fincher's really very good, good commentaries. At them. Yeah, um, it felt like thirty five percent of this movie was reshot. You uh-huh. talk about the they shoot went being back really to long. Sweden. Yes, they did four months in Sweden, and then they did some fill in stuff, and then they did go back to Sweden for like a month or two. But not even like that. Reshoots were tacked on. Where he like in the run of regular production, they would shoot a sequence, and it was most of like the big sequences, and he'd just be like, "We didn't get it the first time." We went back. You're watching the second well, version of the, the scene. Well, the other thing is he hired a Swedish cinematographer named Frederick Bekar, and then a few weeks in, they fired him yes. and brought in Jeff Cronin with his uh, social network collaborator. Yeah. Uh, and Fincher is kind of like, I was trying maybe to be a little too cute with the, like, let's really go Swedish with it. And sure. then me and this guy were not seeing eye to eye and all. And I relented and was like, let me get my guy in here. Yeah. Uh, but 
it certainly Cronenworth was like, I wanted to do a whole Sven Nyquist thing, like, you know, warm fires, cold rooms, yeah. you know, like I wanted to be but Swedish with it. An argument for this being like Fincher being given the keys to the kingdom sort of blank check status. There's one of the scenes where they're both looking at the laptop together in the latter half of the movie. Um, she's got this like tiny little gap in her hair that feels like it happened by accident, which he refers to as like the Louise Brooks gap. Sure. Where her bangs are down and there's just this little split off center. And he was like, so we shot this scene and then like four months later we reshot it and it wasn't until I cut the two pieces together because we were using pieces from both that different. I realized the gap wasn't in there. Right. So Lola, the special effects house, who's like one of the best, they do like all the de-aging, they're like top level. He was like, they had to track in the gap over and over again and That's I think so it's really funny. worth it. I um, mean, I get it. I couldn't lose it. Yeah. And you're like, oh, they really just let him do whatever the fuck he wanted on this movie. I mean, that's such a classic Fincher That probably story. cost $250,000. Yeah, well, I paid for it. I, I thought well, it was good crucial. Job. Thank you. Next I mean, time, I didn't have the money. I was pretty poor back then. I had to take out a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, fucking Patreon's paying off. <laughs> still right. I'm still fucking still. going to the bank. And like, are you the bangs into... guy? And I'm like, I'm the bangs guy. Here they got go. like 12 liens on you. <laughs> um, I just think if you're going to have a character with bangs, you have to be honest to the bangs experience. Yeah. Even if that involves... Special effects. I'm not saying he's wrong, but it's just like you can tell how relieved he is that they were like, and it was complicated and they had to track it and her head keeps on moving in the shot. But I really think it was important. Feels like a funny like Fincher self-challenge to have a character with bangs. Yes. Then you got to keep track of the bangs. Yeah. Um, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Mm -hmm. uh, you know who's in this movie? Who we both like? Goran Vishnish. Goran Vishnish. Uh, who, of course, I feel like is best known as, as the Luka. villain from Ice Age. Oh, okay. what? Luca Kovac on ER. ER. And he, that's from when you watched ER, right? Like you watched the latter seasons of ER live, right? Have we talked yeah. about this? Like, it was just, I feel like you were an Abby Luca guy. Yes. Because you were too young for I was you know, too young for Clooney like the Clooney. And, I remember like tail end of Dr. Green. That's his name, right? Mark Green. Mm -hmm. The tail end of that. And then, yeah, I'm with like Shane West. Sure. Yep. And Parminder, Nagra, mm -hmm. and like that whole, mm -hmm. I just feel like ER was always on, but gotcha. Goran really sort of, he was know, like the imprinted bad on me. saber tooth from Diego's pack. And, and it's in like ER that's too. the only kind of legitimately threatening villain in the, in the Ice original? Age series. In the first one, yeah. I saw that. Yeah. He's good in it. I wonder if my mom was like, it's got the guy from ER. <laughs> my, you know why <laughs> no. I remember that it's him? Because my mom fucking did that. I think really? this might she have been said to me. She was there for Visnich? Yeah. She wasn't a Dennis Leary fan? No, I mean, because we, uh, my she mom wasn't like, like, Leguizamo always does a voice. My I mom and I go to see it opening weekend with Romley. And I remember for whatever reason, it was it was playing at the uh, the Ziegfeld. <laughs> sure, biggest screen needed. And for whatever reason, it was a big hit the first one. Yeah, for those 480p graphics or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> for whatever reason, the marquee uh, outside the Ziegfeld was Romano... Legazamo, Leary, Visnich. They put Visnich wow. over the title, and the we're title. walking up. And my mom goes, "Oh, Visnich is in this!" Like it, that. She finally got excited. Look, anyway. I mean, I feel that anytime he's in there, he is not very important. Again, a role that is in every book. That guy who's sort of like, yeah, one of the because the whole thing with Lisbeth is mm -hmm. either people either see her and are like, "How do I exploit this person?" Uh, sure. And then there are a few characters like him and like um, her original caretaker. Where they obviously sort of, you know... They're like, she's weird, but I'll go with it. Right, quasi-guardians. Yeah. And they just accept how prickly she is. Sure. Like, uh, you know, there's two times in the movie, I think, that she... Wa I believe that she walks into a room and says, hey, hey. Oh, uh, which it's, is so sweet. It's, it's the, pretty much the only time you ever the, hear her say something sweet. It's the nicest thing of yeah. all time. And once is when she's going to see her original caretaker and she yeah. finds that he's had a stroke. And the second time is when she's looking for Blomquist late in yeah. the movie. And when she says it for Blomquist, you're like, fuck. fuck. She's really... It's when he's uh, he's already tied up by Skarsgård yes. at that point. Yes. It's so cute when she says it's it. It's so cute. And it's like literally the only cute thing she does. At least... Hey, hey. Hey, hey. I think uh, she has a lot of cute well, things. She has a lot of cute She's stuff. very cute. Sure. Yeah. Tattoos. She's like e. rapist pig on when someone. When she's like, yes. I got it with the memory. No, no, no. Ugh. She does. I mean, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Um, but so, uh, uh, may I kill him? May I kill oh, him is yeah. so good. It's cute. Yeah, it's adorable. <laughs> it kind of is. Yeah. Like that she clearly is like, I, I should just triple check. I, 
my read on this situation is that this guy was trying to kill my friend, but I so I know that sometimes I'm not great with social stuff, so yes. maybe I should just so that check. Was Fincher, right. well, Fincher it, him talking about that line was really interesting. He said that line was his creation, mm -hmm. and that it was not meant to be like because he, in the book uh, he just, she just goes after Skarsgård her. just drives into a, off a cliff, yeah, right? You know. And he said it's not that yeah, she's she, like if she goes after him; it doesn't really matter. Asking for his permission to kill him right it's that she knows that she doesn't understand social cues right that she now respects his sense of morality and that she's asking him am i right in thinking that i should go kill him now right right right, right. right. like does picked, that have, feel I, justified? have i put this all together correctly right. also you have the whole first half of this movie that's sort of doubling down on the violence against her and kind sure. of perpetuated by her and it's been a long time talking to our friend caroline simons about the fact that her Shana big caroline. her big oscar scene was when she's threatening the mm -hmm. new caretaker and she's like, I'm crazy. And, and she's got the, the black you know, she's got, eye makeup. It's, it's a very and, yeah. cool scene, but it's sure. like, that's so like not indicative of what no. a lot of that performance no, uh, is. It, th that's Lisbeth doing a performance. Yeah. She right. knows she's there to terrify him into submission. Yes. And no. it's sort of the only callback to that first part is like, remember, she's crazy technically, right. Uh, right. which we've spent the whole movie kind of disproving also. Her Oscar scene should be their first meeting. Totally. That's the scene yeah. where you're like, holy fucking when shit. When she looks at him, when he says yeah. the killer of women thing. Yeah. 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 But that whole I scene, mean, as we yeah. said, the thing with the photo, all of that oh, is just like. I got it. Yeah. Um, yes. It's, in, yeah. It's another thing Fincher said of just like, I, I, I want to make it really important that she's like a character of the information age. Right. And that the way she processes information is totally different beyond the fact that she has a photographic memory. She brings her camera around with her because like she's not she's never going to write something down. Right. Right. Everything is like save it as a file. Blomqvist is this very like he is like he's post-it you know, notes color coded yeah, on a he's, wall. He's a, he's a real sort of reportery, you yeah. know, in every way. Like everything has to get written down. It was pointed out to me how funny it is that she uses a Mac and just that a character like that would definitely have a PC. You think so? Laptop. Yeah. Well, well, she would have like Linux. You're right. Yeah, like, she she'd, would be, be, she'd yeah. be on like weird programs that Mac yes. would almost be like not customizable. I think you're such a slut for Apple, though. So, no, I, I I totally know why. I but well, it I is believe funny. in the books she uses Macs. Like it is, yeah. it is. No, I know which is weird. Books, it, that right. is a funny part of the book. Is they're always like she used like this kind of MacBook it, Pro generation whatever. That's the, the book is like very. It's like fucking <laughs> Game of Thrones where they start talking about pigeon pie or whatever. Sure. You know, for two paragraphs, and you're like, I don't care. They're like, this is the data but plan she has on her phone. Yeah, like it's literally, like, okay. he's like, she wanted a MacBook Pro G3, and you're like, okay, I get it, a good computer. The books after Larson died are mostly about firmware updates <laughs> that was the one thing legally you could still write about. they publish the terms and agreements in full in the book <laughs> right it's actually mm -hmm. two whole chapters of just like you're do just you like accept? she actually reads them she reads the whole thing she's the one <laughs> she's got a photographic memory the girl who reads the terms and agreements um but then she's like i don't agree because she's a cyber criminal yeah, that she is goes true. no no yeah. uh yeah no the books um have a lot of hacker stuff in them that I have always sort of accepted as a little cheesy. Like, I don't think Stieg Larsson was an expert on cybersecurity. Oh, sure. Because the books are just often, it's like, then Lisbeth did something magic and she could see the guy's screen. And you're like, okay, great. Well, that's sort I of her main trick. Is that's she what just, she's always She just doing. gets on the guy's screen and then right. she, like, sits and watches someone else use computer. Right. This right. gets to a question I've been meaning to she's ask. She's like this little bug that goes into people's brains. Yes? I've been burning to ask. Okay. Ben. Ben, can you get the fire extinguisher? Ben Hosley. I'm on fire with this question. How much does Rooney Mara as Lisbeth Salander in this film match your conception of a, good a thing you've pitched many times as a dramatic conceit you want to see in film? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I know where you're going. Yes. Witches. Yes. Witch hacker. I know she's not literally a witch in this. She's no, not she, a Wiccan. But there, I, it's there. She's I kind was of watching this and going, I think this is what's in Ben's mind's eye. 100%. With literal magic involved. Just to quickly give some context for maybe some listener who doesn't know uh, what we're talking about. Sure. I've had this concept for a long time, which is that I think that there should be witch hackers in movies where they literally manipulate the computer through spell. Right. They don't even touch the keyboard. <laughs> Correct. Mm -hmm. They just use like I kind of I mean, picture that's sort purple of what she's doing. magic, purple magic uh -huh, that just uh -huh. goes to the keyboard. Do you and think then... like that's what the old mentor of the witch says? Like now you will learn the purple magic. <laughs> yes. yes. This yes. magic is purple. Yes. And then they stare into a cauldron sure. and they look at 
algorithms. Now, at one point, <laughs> Fran, uh, I was I was nodding off there. They said, "I'm like boring," uh, which is why we're staring at that. Algorithm. Algorithm. <laughs> at one point, Fran Ben uh, folded this concept into his great unfinished screenplay, Night Eggs, of about course. a detective who eats eggs at night. Yeah. yeah. Which mm-hmm. Chris White's was supposed to produce, and is now hello, Chris. Kind of indefinitely postponed. Not uh, indefinitely. Well, you know, we're going to pick talks. it back up. Yeah. I, we're indefinitely pick doesn't it back mean permanently. Well, the strike, girl. The strike. Indefinitely. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Chris Pencils Weiss down. and his wife were uh, came care. to visit New York a couple months ago, and we went and uh, had drinks with them, uh, okay, David and I. Thanks for the invite. I'll tell you next time. Uh, ben could not make it. Um, okay, so I could have. And Chris's wife does not listen to the podcast, is a lovely person who's smart and has better things to do with her time. And we were trying to explain the night eggs thing to her, all of which was new to her and Chris was like yeah and I wrote pages myself and I was like working on this with Ben and she was like what's the premise we were like detective he eats eggs at night and she was like okay it's a little thin you could never finish that screenplay we're like hacker witches and she went wait hacker witches is interesting (laughs) and she (laughs) truly was like yeah she was like Chris that actually you could spin that off into something hacker witches has some juice to it damn okay well I've been talking about this uh, this idea on the podcast for many years just if in case anyone tries yeah, to no, no, steal no. TM 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 yeah exactly yeah but no you're right I, I uh, her look yeah the I was gonna ask you about her look the kind of like I mean how would you like it's goth yes it's but it, it's like we were sort of looking up the clothes too it's it a lot of goth. Rick Rick wet Owens goth. Wet goth. a lot of oh, helmet length perfect lang. well it's yes. funny because sometimes you have These a character are both spot on well. You have a character who, like, dresses like shit in a movie, but you know sort of as someone watching, like, that's a $100 t-shirt that they've made look bad. But it's like, they don't even try to really make her look that grubby. Like, for someone who has to, like, ask for money for a computer, she's in, like, designer clothes. Well, and, like, Merchandise Spotlight, this is a movie that had, like, fucking high thread count tie-ins where they were just, like... We collabed with sure. this fashion yeah. brand, and yeah. everything she wears is available for sale. Fuck you, totally, you fucking yeah. fuck. Oh, really? Yeah, they did a lot. Oh, yeah, of, I love the when shirt she's in the that fuck says you. "fuck you, you fucking <sighs> fuck." fuck. In, the in the big that's scene, maybe that's why that can't be the Oscar scene. Because it says "fuck you, you." But fucking But in the fuck. trailer, they erase her shirt oh, digitally to allow right. that says, scene in the trailer. Screw you, you screwing screw. <laughs> Doesn't say that. I, I, downtown Griffin names grew up in the West Village, uh, and Eighth Street between Fifth and Sixth used to be. 70% uh, smoke shops that also sold novelty t-shirts. Mm. And fuck you, you fucking fuck was like the shirt that was in every single yeah. window yeah. Oh, yeah. growing up where my dad would be like, cover your eyes. <laughs> and that shirt was just like, it loomed so large in my childhood because we walked by there like every day and you'd see it multiple times. The moment that shirt comes on screen, it felt to me like a surprise Marvel cameo where I'm like, holy shit, they did it. Now, they put it on the big, I never thought they'd if- adapt it. It's from Blue Velvet, right? The That's, shirt? The, the phrase. Oh, the quote? It, Hopper huh. says that in Blue Velvet. And I'm sure, like, a man had said that before in history. Yeah. But, like, I do think that is what the original reference is. Interesting. I think of it as being the shirt in It's the from window. T-shirts, right. You yeah. know, you're like, yeah, the famous quote from T-shirt. It's also funny because it's like, right, that's a shirt you can't trademark, but also every one of them had the exact same font. It is the exact shirt yeah. in this movie. I've never yeah. seen a different look for uh, one of those that shirts. That and uh, same shit, different day, and there's a third shirt. There were three shirts where it was like, there's three shirts with swear words on them that are in every stall at Camden Market, like when I was a Yeah, kid. one tequila, two tequila, three tequila floor. That's, I mean, mm-hmm. that's pretty funny. I feel like there were a lot of shirts that were like cartoon characters with bloodshot eyes holding a bong, and yeah, they were like well, yeah, you know, Sonic Calvin the Weed Peeing, Hog and shit. You know, a lot of Sonic, yeah, yeah a lot of Calvin Peeing shit on 8th yeah. Street. Yeah. So, in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, for the first hour of the movie, there are two storylines. So, the first storyline follows Mikhail Bunkvist, yes. uh, Sweden's hottest libel artist, uh-huh. a, a, a journalist for a hip indie magazine called Millennium. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, Mikael Magazine. Who has been disgraced uh, because he lost a libel suit in Swedish court against an industrialist. It's the yeah. Michael Clayton thing I love of like, you start this movie with a character who could be kind of just like a functionary sort of like uh, a cipher, you know, investigator uh, kind of thing. And you start it with the guy in the hole. You start it with, like, this guy's broken because of stuff that happened before this movie started, you know? Yeah, yeah and it's this, that, like, up. because he's fucked up, it's, you know, his reputation's at stake, but also what's at stake is, like, he's bored. 
Yeah. He's got to do something. And in a lot of ways, like the story he finds himself in doesn't really have to do with the mistakes he's made in the past. They they push yeah. him into making those decisions. Mm-hmm. And it it dovetails in certain ways, but it's just like, like every time you cut to fucking Michael Clayton selling off the supplies of his failed restaurant, Mm. Mm. you know, where you're just like, this guy's got this thing. Do you think it was a good restaurant? No, I think it's no. Like the food was bad. Yeah, you know what they don't get into. Like the vibe was probably okay, but the food was bad. It was just a TGI Fridays franchise. Food was good in like 2007. We're not like, ah, what a great era for food. It was. I think restaurants. There were some restaurants. No, 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 it's right about this. No, Ratatouille comes out in 2007. That's when food got good. They started hiring Ratatouille, and then it was Chef. Yes. And then it was Burnt. Yes. Um. Then the Bear. And then Dub Bear. Uh, Dub Bear, of course, uh, invented food. Uh, and we thank him for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the one who put, I'm trying to think of one of the bear's big dishes now, put cannoli, omelet? made cannoli. Well, well omelet. He invented drinking out of a quart, mm. uh, yeah. plastic a quart plastic container. Crumple, yeah, no yeah. one he had did ever that. done that before. Right. He invented saying corner. Has anyone done a recut of I love the bear, to be clear. Ratatouille in the style of the bear I, and call it the rat? I think there is a yes, whole Chef quadrant Remy. of yeah, AI they're, just they're doing, not that. Stopping like, doing that. Like okay. over and over again. Like there's a whole field in Montana with AI bots just I'm just thinking like, sort of like the what Spider-Man, if the bear was Ratatouille? Yeah. The Spider-Man nursery rhymes like on YouTube. But whatever. I don't want the AI version. I want someone to get in there, get their hands dirty, do a recut. What if they were like bear shining, but it's for a romantic three, comedy. but it's rat- ratatouille? Yeah, good, fun. It's a ratatouille yeah. ultra, AR alternate universe. Okay, yeah. so Blankfist gets a call from uh, industrialist, other industrialist, Henrik Wanger, played uh-huh. by Christopher Plummer. Christopher okay. Plummer, I'm going to put it forward. Best 80s of any actor. You're obsessed ever. with his 80s, and we don't mean the 1980s. Nope. We mean the decade he was eighty. The decade he was eighty, which uh, does he die? Did he did he hit ninety or were was all he of died his... at the age of ninety one? Okay, so I I extend the run to the nineties. I think Jessica Tandy is the only person you could argue surged that hard that late. So Christopher Plummer would have turned eighty, and let's find out. Let's just find out. Just okay, find let's out. all settle 2010? down. Uh, 2009. Okay. So we're going to start with, uh, when, when, and when is, yeah, okay, 2009. Last Station, he gets his first Oscar nomination. No, 2009. Up. Uh Uh-huh. Remember, he's the voice of the villain? Yeah, Charles Munz. Apparently he was Dr. Parnassus? He's one of them. Oh, he's only one of them? I forgot if that. Oh no, no, the, no! You're right. Yeah, That's I think the Doctor Panassus yes. is this no, sort of Wizard of Oz. You're right. right. Yes, it's the other guy. The other guys the are other all guys. called yeah. whatever Alex Tony or some or shit. Yeah, Tony, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Last Station indeed gets his first Oscar nomination after so many years. And playing it was whole story. It was viewed as a career achievement, kind of tip of the cap, and you're like, whatever. Sort of the Langella I do not remember nom. this movie. Yeah, he plays Tolstoy. It's like, what if Tolstoy and Tolstoy wife, played by Helen Mirren, yelled at each other, and around that, James McAvoy had a crush on, I want to say, Carrie Condon? Yes. Okay, this sounds like a movie I'll like. Yeah, it was one of those great it boring movies. It kind of sucks I piss. I like that. <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of uh, okay. bad. And you were just like, this kind of sucks. The plumbers had this incredible career. He got snubbed a bunch of times. He should have gotten noms. They're finally giving it to him for this. And here's his career capper. I and I like guess. It. It's about to be lights out on on Christopher Plummer. And then he just starts throwing fucking haymakers. So then you've got Beginners. Win an amazing Academy movie. Award. And, and like skates. Like the movie comes out in June and it's like no one's beating him. He's just going to run the table for the next nine months winning every award. Yeah, that movie um, rock. Apparently he was in that uh, Paul Bettany movie Priest. Yeah. Uh, with uh, Carl Urban and Maggie Q. I've seen Priest. It's a loose remake of The Searchers. Cool. Kind of rules. I want to see it. Yeah. Uh, apparently, he played John Barrymore. That doesn't really matter. Uh, he did a voice. That in was Skyrim. a one man show cool. that I think was then filmed and turned into a movie. Right. Go on. Uh, Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, which I think he's excellent in. Yes. Incredible. Um, then uh, what else do we have here? We've got Danny Collins. Apparently, he was in that one. Yeah, he plays some fucking. Uh, he, he he played some fucking guy in that <laughs> yeah. one. You got all the money in, in the, the world. world yeah. All the money in the world. But I mean, one of the most astonishing narratives around a performance. It was crazy, yeah. and he Obviously. kills it. It was he awesome. Kills Much it. discussed. He's so uh, good in it. And He's then you the have Knives Out. Thing. He did a lot of like random shit as well. But yeah, Knives Out. Knives Out is, I guess, his real farewell. I think if you just say his eighties contains. 
Yeah. Beginners. Beginners. Knives Out, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, All the Money in the World. It's really good. Those are four insane performances to give for a guy where every time he showed up on screen, they were like, and this is probably his last movie, right? He's going to die yeah, immediately. Yeah, he got three Oscar noms, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is there a fourth I'm forgetting? No, it's those three. He got three and he won one. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. Fucking rules. Fran, did you know that he was in The Sound of Music? As what? Wait, one of the you, kids? Did you really not know this? No, I know that. Oh, okay. okay. No. He played the music. Fuck, you got me. Yeah, he was one of the mountains. Wow. He was yeah. he played the lonely goat herd. <laughs> they put him on I strings. I mean, kind of. Um, kind of. Yeah. I didn't know that though. I was just That's like, him. who's this damn hottie? I was gonna say, you want a trivia fact? He's fine as fuck in that yeah, movie. Yeah. But I mean, still, even in his eighties, he's like looking like a real guy, I mean, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's 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 very, he's, he's looking he's very like, handsome. Have you seen Beginners? Uh, yeah, no. Okay. Well, see, oh, begin, Beginners. the whole plot of Beginners is like, what if my dad was a snack? Yeah, okay. And coming to terms with that, right? He's uh, Ewan McGregor's dad who comes out in his eighties. Uh huh. And, and you know it's his like, boyfriend, Goran Vicenich. Yeah, yes. From this movie. Wow. But he basically, like, now that your mother is dead, I can tell you I've been gay this whole time and I finally want to live my truth. And then it's just like Christopher Plummer starts wearing really nice sweaters. He does oh, wear some good sweaters. Okay. And there's All a right. dog. There's fun stuff. I'm and the put dog it on the speaks list. in subtitles. You'll love this movie. Though. It's, a it's so gentle. Yeah. It's a very gentle movie. I also was trying to come up with an old person snack. Uh, dried apricots. He's oh, sure. looking like a real dried apricot. Yes. Okay, well, I eat those, so. I do, too. They're really Shit. good. Okay. I um, think he's great in Dragon Tattoo. I do, too. Because he does have just that because you you know in this he's movie gent- he's gentle he's or very gentle he? but right you need that edge of like is this guy full of shit like you know is this guy sort of covering something up that's beyond the scope of what he's telling he's us he's also he's got to set everything up not yes. just plot wise but the stakes and that sort of but like he, ambiguity and then be incapacitated for most of the movie he's gonna be out still the last half of the large movie. right over. but like he's so sad Yes. And that is the character, obviously, in the book, too, and so haunted. Yeah. And he's haunted by the disappearance of his niece, obviously. Mm-hmm. But it's also, like, he's haunted by, like, the, the, all these books, especially this one, but all, you know, are just about, like, Sweden is, you know, the social de- democratic society is just this, like, gossamer thin veil over, like, a history of, like, Nazism and sexism sure. and, like, rampant, like, you know, darkness. Like, that's yeah. Stieg Larsson's whole take. Right, men who hate women, they're yes. everywhere. Scratch the surface and you'll find them. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, he lives in this frozen castle. He's successful mm-hmm. and he's like miserable. And, and he's, he's like surrounded by all these like right. nieces and nephews all who all hate each other. Are they hate him. They and think they're he's crazy. Evil. Yeah. I think we're identifying though the, the money s- is ill gotten. The secret sauce to why Christopher Plummer's eighties were so good. Thousand Island dressing? Yes. No, what? Uh, no, he he was like a horrible alcoholic for decades. Sure, and basically talks about like I. I mean, he's he has a reputation for being a huge asshole. Yes, yes. no, but that's what I'm saying. He he always sort of in this period he talked about like I kind of like fucked myself over for forty years. Right. Right. I was like an asshole. You're right. You're right. I that's fought. in the performance. That's sort of like, oh, I could have been better. I ran yeah, away yeah, from yeah, success. Yeah. Sound of Music came out. I was like, fuck you. I drank myself into oblivion. And basically, he like in his 70s starts to like under, he gains a perspective yeah. that all the performances we're talking about have that feeling of hauntedness of like, did I throw away half my life? Did I fuck something up I can never get back? This is my final moment to sort of reclaim something or try to set something better before I go. Right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yes. I, that And of course, the one of the many twists of this movie is that Wanger is a relatively uncomplicated person. Yes. Like, he is not part of the mystery. No. It really? No. Like, he is a bystander to no. most of it. He was maybe ignorant. Like, he refused yeah, to look more... at what was happening in front of him. Yeah, and it's like, it's the book vanger who's just sort of like, well, now that I know, we can just keep everyone else out of this. Sure. Like, I, it was just about me knowing. Yeah. It was he, not about exposing the truth Yeah, the whole publicly. point, right, of he's the like, this of the about book me. is that Blankfist is like, I'm a journalist, I'm going to write this up. And he's like, you can't do that. Right. Which is, you know, you see both sides of it, obviously, mm-hmm. like, in a way, but... Go Blancfist, go. But then Blancfist just does a bunch of other journalism. He's always doing the journalism. Yes. He's always talking about what people don't want to hear about, you know? Mm. He's Um, a truth teller. He's kind of a comedian of the press. So he gets, uh, yes, so he gets summoned. He's the Joker of Sweden. He gets summoned to uh, this, like, remote uh, place. Hedestad? Hedestad made up 
uh, part of Sweden. And uh, he is told, like, ostensibly we work on my memoirs, but really I want you to fully dig into our whole family and figure out what the hell happened to my niece who vanished. On this you know, weird day. On this yes. weird... Where there was a car crash on the bridge. So many pictures. That turns it into a locked door, like, rock, locked room mystery, but for an entire islanders. Like, there was no right. way anyone could get off this island. So she died here or right. whatever. And what happened? And the, the only people on the island were the either only, either yes. my family or people who worked for the family. All of whom I hate. And of I'm course, that is the trick, especially of the book, is it's like Martin Vanger, who even if you're reading the book, you might think, well, this guy seems like a possible suspect, was not there. Right. So he his alibi is ironclad. And then even when Craig asks him, he's like, smart, of course, you have to make me one of the suspects. Like, right, he's, right. he's not fighting it. Okay, yeah, so... Uh, yeah. Come live press here. Press flowers. You're disgraced. I'm getting these press flowers every year. I, I feel like that it's a killer taunting me. Right. I called. Uh, I love that actor. I love that guy too. Uh, that actor, of course, is um, what's that's his all name? I Donald know. Sumter as Morel, as the old detective. All I oh, know such is, a good guy. Well, he's one of the maesters. He plays a good guy, but I got some bad news for you. What's that? When we cut to flashbacks, it's who David plays Denchik. it? It's Detective Puss, the most despicable character we've ever covered <laughs> on this podcast. Uh, a all, man I still feel triggered by seeing on screen. Also, uh, David, Puss from season two of Top of the Lake. Uh, uh, David Denchik, who's also in Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and a few other things, but do you know what else he's in? What? A little movie called The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Swedish version. Oh, yes, He's the only right. guy in both. He plays uh, one he of plays the staff at like Millennium. like Joel Kinnaman. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. He plays yes. uh, one of the newspaper guys. Yeah. yeah. It's just funny. No, in both of these movies, he in both versions, he plays benevolent, supportive, helpful characters. And I just still, I still, I see I never Puss. watched. China Girl, he plays truly Satan. He plays the worst character I've ever seen in anything. I mean, it's, Top of the Lake season one stressed me out too much already. It's season like, two I'm is not another gonna, one. Yeah. It's a very good performance that makes you angry at him for happening. Remember when we did an, a Patreon episode just slamming puss around the room like a squash ball, and then like the eight people who had actually seen season two were like, they were too hard on puss. Yeah, people thought we were too hard on puss. His name is puss. Sort of a hairy hole situation. Yeah. <laughs> Oh boy! And so. that's the Tinker Taylor guy. I always forget that. Where I'm like, where is that guy? Because in Tinker yeah. Taylor, it's all like really recognizable actors, and then him. Not that he's full respect. I think yeah. he's a good actor. Oh, I meant he's that director. I'm always director. like, where oh, did the... Snowman? Oh well, he got. Yeah, well, no, I know. That's got what I'm saying. He, yeah, he, fell, he fell in a hairy like, hole. He can't where get out. He? And yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Um. So. The lawyer Dirk Frode. The lawyer Dirk Frode, I love played by they... Stephen Burkoff. Mm -hmm. Uh, who we recently saw in a Bond movie, right? He's the villain in Octopussy. Oh, okay. Uh, a legendary British playwright. Sure. Uh, I just feel like Fincher is sitting down and like stack up guys with faces for me, please. Yeah. Like yeah. Game of Thrones guy, bring him in. Yeah. Phone calls. Uh, you know, Burkoff, bring him in. How dare they? Um, uh, Goran Viznich, sure. But like, I feel like, you know, everybody on the island is just like a great old craggy well, face. The the, uh, the name of the actor who plays the new uh, Guardian. Uh, the most, oh. the, the puss of this film, if you will. Oh, yeah. Um, that guy is called Jorik van Wangen. I, you know, he's Dutch. Uh, obviously, phenomenal. Black it's hat. I was going to say, he's in the Blank Check uh, Scumbag Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Black Hat, he's uh, one of the guys, one of the, the scummy uh, criminal escapee villains in Chronicles of Riddick. And there's another escape that he was in. Escape Plan? Room. Oh. Both. Right. Oh. He is the, he's he's the, the inventor the yes. of Escape Room I and both Escape Rooms. Love him. I think he's a very he's underrated amazing. actor. He's also, yes. like, this is kind of a fearless performance in a way because he is so immediately despicable. Yes. And, like, the sight of him shirtless, like, yeah. after he assaults... Um, uh, Elizabeth yep. with like his belly out, and you're just like, what's well, when she's torturing him? Well, that's later. But oh, like, sure. don't you see? Maybe I'm in, maybe I'm. Fin Fincher said uh, he, as he put it, canvassed everyone in his life who he knew who had experienced some sort of traumatic abuse, right, to try to get this right and not be salacious in the way he was depicting it. And he said, if you're in her position and you're you've decided you want to torture this guy, right? And you're you're going to like attack him in this way and whatever. Uh, w would you take his clothes off or not? And everyone he talked to said like I would not. I would not want to see his naked body, even if I'm tattooing his chest 
or I'm inserting stuff into him or whatever. I don't like fully disrobe him. And so they shot it that way. And the test audiences reacted negatively where they were like, well, it feels weird and disproportionate that she's naked during her assault and that he's not. So they made him reshoot the scene. Mm. And this feels like what a nightmare to be yeah, told. Be like, like, we're hey. going back and doing this again. Yeah. And he basically, he said, like, they offered me this part. I was like, I don't want to have to do this. Sure. Like, I don't want to have to live through this. I don't want to get in this guy's head. I don't want to do these scenes. I want to work for Fincher so badly that I just, I'm going to muscle through it. And Fincher was like, he's incredible. He is incredible he's because like a he's true not a mustache actor. twirler. Like, no. you know, he's he's quite vile, even, you know, like, the, just the first second you see him. Correct. But, like, he feels like a, you know, a person who would behave this way. Like, yes. it yeah. feels like part of a system that, you know, There's no way cannot... it doesn't feel, like, a thankless sort of... <laughs> no, yeah, no yeah, one yeah. yeah. But, I, but I also, I see him in this, and it's, like, the moment he's pinned in my mind forever. And there's something well, to the I don't know fact... him from anything else. Black, Black Hat Chronicles of Riddick. Oh, Come on. He's the final guy in Black Hat. Hemsworth stabs him like 80 times. It's awesome. It's like a pen. I remember one yeah, thing that fools. happens in Black Hat. Which is? The he go on computer. I yeah. mean. Okay, two that's things. That's the ultimate <laughs> he go on computer movie. Right. That's sort of the end of that era. There are two genders. Yeah, a little bit. Girl with the Dragon. Now, I mean, we, go, now we go on algorithm. Because it made eight bucks. Like, yeah. you know. Made a Black Hat. Right. Um, no, I, I think. Well, what's the one thing you remember from Black Hat? When, they, when they kill. Viola Davis. VD. Viola and I'm Davis, like, yeah. what? Yeah. Tough. It is tough. They also. No, it's cure crazy. VD. And they do cure VD. He comes up I with wish. the cure for VD. It's, um, a, it's a great moment. But she's amazing in the movie. She's like, what? The thing about his performance uh, is that, uh, old Yurik, uh, is that, uh, yes, he avoids the mustache twirling in a way that makes it more unsettling. Because you could, you could play this character more stereotypically villainously in a way that creates more of a distance. Where you're like, well, obviously this guy is awful. But he plays him like a real terrible person rather than a terrible person in a thriller, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Which makes it more insidious, more upsetting. Yeah. Um, the girl with the dragon tattoo. Um, I just, before we get to Elizabeth, yes, uh, the, just, I love how the first half of this movie, Blomqvist, he's such a, a, a bimbo, like yep. one of these, you know, like he's in this house. He's like, how make hot... Mm -hmm. burn burn book in burn in book. fireplace why why not warm mm -hmm. you know he can barely mm -hmm. like feed himself and he's just you know all he wants to do is take his glasses off and or put them around his neck <laughs> and like walk around taking yeah. notes what's and, with that like every woman he meets know. he's is, sort of flirting with the, i think the original no, film? no it's not no. like in the it's books like, they're like and then blankfist took off his glasses in a way no one has ever put done them like halfway on his face <laughs> i Friend, think it's I, just craig's your your letterbox review called this out I, I looked up your old letterbox review for oh, this movie. Yeah. I don't about know what I said. Daniel Craig wearing glasses the way that no one has ever worn glasses in their yeah. life. I know this was a big bit uh, Paul F. Tompkins he did on every podcast yeah, yeah, for yeah. years. I Driving myself insane that I now can't remember what it was. But like uh, within the last month, in the lead up to this episode, I watched some documentary or newscast. Oh, is someone doing Where that? there was a real person <gasps> doing this. <gasps> and I went, holy shit, it's the one person who actually vindicates Daniel Craig's glasses business. Where they did the exact same hanging underneath the chin. But maybe then he looks it up and it was uh, Jim Fakerson. I can't figure out who the fuck man. it is. And if I ever do, I will tweet it after this episode comes out. Um, I mean, look, there's a chance that Daniel Craig, who I believe may wear glasses in mm. real life. Most, you know, I've never seen Yeah, why not? I don't know. Like, maybe he does that, but it more felt like Daniel Craig being like, you know, I got, I've got a new take on glasses. It's cinematic. Yeah, exactly. I right. don't know. Um, it's fun actor-y shit. I, you well, know. it always feels like when, is it, Debbie Reynolds does her, like, Meryl impression on Larry King, and she's just, like, futzing with the glasses, you know, take them off uh, yes. and, like, Fucking you know. Nails her to the wall. I mean, truly. But that's sort of what Craig is doing here with the glory. He's this like, I'm is. really going to make a little, I got yeah. my one prop. And also, like, if you're going to do, like, you know, a movie about men who go on computer, you yep. might be worried, like, it, will this feel dynamic at all? Like, Correct. You know. Yeah, and a lot of his dialogue is shoe leather. Uh, I think yeah. Craig's smart about that, yeah, about how to yeah, make yeah. all of it feel a little more active. Uh, 
But what I think is crucial in this movie is that once Elizabeth joins him, mm-hmm. and now we can talk about Elizabeth. An hour yeah. and one fifteen minutes. The why do I keep saying one fifteen? I don't Go know. <laughs> Halfway into the movie is the answer. Yeah. Uh, the movie comes to life, like in a way, like their yes. scenes come to life. The camera is much more active, like in their little cottage. All of a sudden, it's like whipping around. Like it feels like there's energy. Like they're this weird little like. Do you know what I'm saying though? Of how like the first half of this movie almost feels I, I don't like know it's. What you mean by half one and what? One hour and one fifteen minutes. <laughs> one one hours. Um, you guys are like mad at each other today. Furious. We're it's it's sort of crazy. Right? No, yeah. like, come on. Uh, no, no. You should mention no, that we're recording this episode strangling each other. Homer yeah, and yeah, Bart yeah. style. You should also mention that I made this episode air at uh, happen early in the morning so that I could go see Saw Ten. Yeah, Saw correct. One and a half. Correct. Let's have that on the record. I mean, like, we gotta get it on the record, right? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, the first half of this movie feels like it is two magnets being held apart from each other right. by force. I'm like getting mad during the first half of this movie. You're like, Every time I watch, because I'm like, but it makes the payoff so. It does make powerful. the payoff good, but I'm so like, by the time we get there, like, I'm like, I want to turn the movie off. But you know? it feels weaponized. Like it feels yeah, like totally. Fincher knows that's that's the inherent dramatic struggle of adapting this text, right? And I need to own that and lean into it and have the whole movie up until that point, feel like we're waiting for this collision. Well, because especially you're like watching these two and you're like, these two? How, they could never how? get along. What would they ever even talk like about? Peanut butter and chocolate. It um, tastes terrible together. Right. And then when you see Lisbeth, obviously if we follow her track, right, her track is basically, yes, ostensibly her connection is she does a background check on him. So she's been in his life yeah. in this weird intimate way. But apart from that, they have nothing to do with each other. No. And then as we're watching... Blancquist progressed along this murder mystery path. Mm-hmm. We're just watching her. Well, he's like not. Also, is the thing. No, he's not he, really. He's 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 yeah. He's not. He's not. He can't a figure it out. Detective. Yeah. He's yeah. a journalist, so he's interviewing people. I mean, he makes some progress. He finds the pictures. Like, you know, he has yeah. some thoughts. But it's yeah. I mean, it's his daughter who lets him figures. You know, yeah. out the Bible verse thing and all that. You know. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Elizabeth. It's like yeah. What do we what do we see happen to her? Her caretaker. Dies. Mm. Oh, it doesn't die. He doesn't he has die. A stroke. So he has a stroke. He's actually yes. in the sequels. Okay. Another character that sort of has a long and tail. And he's at the end of the movie. Yeah. And he's at the end of the movie. He's got a long tail. They don't show that on screen. It's, it's a Swedish thing. Like 10% of Swedes have these. It's long like tails. marsupilami. Like, can you do tricks with it? 100%. He can pick things up. That's you a know. reasonably good marsupilami. Pull. I'm not, I don't know what that is. I don't is. know what you're talking about. 10 people are going to be thrilled I made that joke. Go is on. Is that another um, children's book? It's a French comic. Oh. Yeah, I think series, I know this Lama. guy. Yeah. They tried to bring him over me? here to the states and didn't really hit. Um, I'm just pulling up some images. Here he is. Oh, okay. Pretty cute. There's yeah. like a crazy expensive CGI live action Alvin the Chipmunk doll Marsupilami French blockbuster directed by Alain Chabat. Is it good? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> eh, no. <laughs> Um. So she has a caretaker. She gets a new one. Right. She's He's a ward so of the state, somewhat mysteriously. Her her kindly benevolent caretaker dies. She's passed off He's to a new dead. one who is not doesn't die. He gets has a stroke. I'm so sorry. He's a com- yeah. incapacitated. Yeah. Passed off to a new one who, in short order, basically like locks up her finances, mm-hmm. um, assaults her, and then. I think in, and is this in the movie? Like in the movie, when she's going back to him, she's trying, she's planning to frame him. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. thinking he's going to make me like suck his dick again, do something terrible, yeah. and yeah. I will catch him. And right. instead, the escalation from him is so shocking. Yeah. Yes, but she went in with the intention she to goes in catch him, like right, that she's not prepared for it, and yeah. that's pretty much the last time that Elizabeth Salander is like caught off guard in this movie, mm-hmm. obviously. Yeah. You also have the scene which is in the book and is in is also kind of good in the original movie, I will say. The subway mugger scene. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. Which is like a little microcosm of like people just underestimate her because she's so small and like is this weird little outsider and then she like fights back with such ferocity that's like sort of surprising. This is not in the book. It's you're right. It's not in the but no. It's, it's just in like the her, movie. her like bike. Her bag just gets like stolen. It just gets stolen. And I think it's like she just locks it up outside somewhere. Yeah. Or Remember whatever. in the Swedish movie, she actually fights them and like kicks them and this shit. Yeah, she say. has a broken bottle. I, right. She's like she really fucks them up. I think New Year Pace is very good in those in that movie. I, I've only seen the first one, right? I think she's good. I think it's I a very good performance. It's you think it's not? I think it's no. I think it's not good. I think it's very like. See, I think it's good, but the characterization is bad. 
Maybe I, that's it. I think it, she but is it's... good, but the movie frames her as too much of a badass, which is like it, very flattening not to even, this character. Yeah, it's that's not why even I don't a badass, really but like just like it. not a real person. Yeah. Yes. Just like a cartoon. Yeah. Like I think she's a pretty interesting actor. Like you love Prometheus. Me. I love Prometheus. Yeah. But yeah, when is Prometheus? It's a year after this oh, just movie, a year. Okay. She gets it because I mean that's her first yeah, big yeah, yeah. Hollywood post original. I mean, it, it's Dragon such Tattoo. a funny. Is it Prometheus arc. then? Sherlock Holmes Correct. too. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. That, no. Sherlock not... Holmes two is first, isn't it? I think Prometheus they is were... first. Am I wrong? The they... Game of Shadows was played in 2011, my friend. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and you know, it was quite the game. Yeah, and they played to win. Who does she play in the, the in that? Like a Romani fortune teller. Mm. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. <laughs> I've never seen that one. Boring. I've only seen the first one. I've watched like most of it on TV. I like, need to watch it before Field this Monster style. sequel comes. Oh, the third, which is definitely happening. Yeah. And it's happening like right away. It's definitely the <laughs> next thing that everyone involved is going to make. Um... Yeah, like Downey Jr. will collect his Oscar in a few months and be like, all right, so Guy, are we going? Yeah. Oh, no, we know it's going to be Dexter, Dexter Fletcher, Fletcher, right? They keep Kind of like that, I guess. Totally. They keep being like, we're like two months away from filming. <laughs> um, it's the next thing on Dexter the dance Dexter Jetster? Dexter yeah, Dexter Jetster, Jetster will be directing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, 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 no, he's, you know, he's good. He's had like a really interesting, like, uh, shifted from behind the, uh, the... The counter. The counter to behind the camera. Yeah, anyway, go on. <laughs> oh boy uh so what else about lisbeth before she gets put in touch with bjork uh with bonkvist is there anything else apart from jo well then she, right, no, she, she exacts her, her horrifying revenge we've talked about her a lot yeah we have yeah in this episode before okay. plot yeah okay well then we won't talk I'm just about saying, her it's anymore. not like I'll we've been the given her short shrift no we have I'll you're keep right you're the right pooter you're... open <laughs> <laughs> that's what lisbeth says she does but keep the pooter open um, and yes, I feel like it's right before Elizabeth meets with Blancfist mm -hmm. is when Blancfist's daughter um, sees the little, the numbers from Harriet's diary on his wall and is like, Bible verses. Those are Bible verses. Yeah, yeah. like the worst thing that's happening to him in his life is that his teenage daughter is like into God. Right. Yeah. He's Which like, do don't you know I'm an independent leftist media? Well, and also it's like, this is Sweden. We killed yeah. God in the yeah. 60s. Like, right. you know, Bergman at all, you know, crushed him dead. She's trad wifing before it was hit. Right. Yeah. Yes, it's the ultimate rebellion. One hundred percent. Dad, I have to go to Dime Square. I can't stay <laughs> but, here. But, any it, but it, it's so, it makes so much sense because Blancfist. It's like, yes, of course, I have a daughter. I have an ex-wife. I'm currently fucking my you know editor. my co-editor in yeah. chief. Her Who husband keeps, is cool with yeah, it. Yeah, he like doesn't care at all. That's not yeah. addressed in the movie, but in the books, the husband's like, yes, I understand. You must fuck fuck Blancfist. We'll still be happily married. Like it's all good. <laughs> yeah, and he like he like likes Blancfist. Yeah, he's, too. yeah, he'll hang out with him and be yeah. like, you're. Who the fuck keeps calling? Why I don't know. You tell me who keeps calling I you. I think I'm on every single spam list in the world. So these now. are all unlisted spam alerts? Yeah, it's so annoying. Spam -like and I feel like my phone used to do better at filtering them. Yes. Like, when well, now it doesn't. No, it's very same. annoying. Um, yes, Blancfist. Uh, so yeah, of course, the best rebellion against that is just like, I'm into Jesus now, and right, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm in middle of the road as they come. I don't know. Robin wrong, but it feels so right. Is that anything? Yeah, mm. sure. Mm. Robin mm. wrong, but it feels so right with a W. I like yeah, no, it. I figured. Yeah. 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 I like it. He kind of seems like a dad that puts his career before anything else. Like, he doesn't seem like a good dad. I think he's a pretty bad yeah. dad. Yeah. I mean, yeah. or at least, like, in everything in his personal life, just not a lot of effort right. being made. The yeah. effort goes And I think it's work. through, like, the grace of his Christian daughter that she likes him. Right. Where yeah. she's like, yeah, and his, whatever, I like his you. His ease of... and. His He's a chiller. Charm. Right. She's think, like, I love my bimbo father. I think I think yes. he plays really well as every scene You've he has. You've had a bimbo with the daughter. daughter. Yeah. Bimbo In girl dad? <laughs> yeah. The bimbo, bimbo is the dad? dad. <laughs> is the bimbo father of daughter. Yes. Uh no, the thing I think he plays really well is every scene he has with her, it's almost like he's going like Right, I should be a better father. Yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Oh, I I this is what I should fucking prioritize. Anyway, get under the train. See you later. Yeah. Um, Nilla, Pernilla, much like Pernilla August, Star Wars. Shmi. Shmi herself. Um, that's her name, is his daughter's name. Anyway, uh, yes, she helps him realize Harriet, who went missing, mm -hmm. and all he's really going on at this point is there's a weird photo where she, where she seems spooked by something in a crowd the sure. day of her disappearance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is very chilling. 
Mm-hmm. Like, it's a really good, you know, sort of little clue, right? It's yeah. like what freaked her out so much. Yeah. Um, but it's, yes, and then her, the daughter points to these Bible verses, and when he brings... Yeah, there's this page of her journal where she's got names of women uh, just initials, and a bunch of right. numbers, or initials of women. Uh, and numbers. Can I Binders just say about parades that they're before Thank security you cameras, you. You're parades welcome. were, like, parade photographers, the original security cameras. Does mm. this make sense? Yep. Uh-huh. Yeah. Whereas, like, yeah. the only way that you were able to capture random images yes. of a day yes. is someone at a parade took a bunch of pictures. Yes. And not only someone, but, like, 12 people. So right. Pruder. Right. The Pruder was at, at every fucking parade. <laughs> That's what people don't realize about <laughs> yeah, that guy. They don't get it. <laughs> he was like, there's a parade, I'm there. Yeah, and 99 times out of 100, nothing interesting. <laughs> click, 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 click. And there they go by. Yeah. Nobody got shot in the head. <laughs> click, 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 click. He was just a freak. He was hoping people click. were going to get shot. Yes. He's like another it's normal Sort of a Richard parade. Jewell situation. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Also, He's like, I hope one. I see some action. <laughs> yes. And then... Yeah. Fuck, what if Clint laid in life as <laughs> a brooder? They were all rooted. They called the worst movie after him. The movie <laughs> no one wants to see. It's not his fault. Right? Yeah. yeah. He just wanted to film a nice parade. He, he <laughs> cast one of the guys from the French train to play as a brooder. He should have kept using those guys in other movies. <laughs> I'm going to play Jack Ruby. Clint, you're too, you're way too old. They railroaded me. <laughs> Jack Ruby got railroaded uh, by the mob. <laughs> he just keeps, there's railroads on top of railroads. I mean, there's a, a lot husband. of railroads there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right He's like, I'm going to play Jack Ruby. Did you know he was a bad dad? I don't think Jack Ruby had children. No, he was bad. <laughs> What he's not in juror number two or whatever. I right? hope he turns out to be playing the judge or something. Ugh. He didn't tell anybody. That would be good. What is it actually called? It's actually called, it's called juror, juror number, number two. Yeah. Hell yeah. I'm so you know excited for that no. fucking film. Clint's new movie. Oh. Who is who's in it? Nicholas Holt. Nicholas Holt. Uh? To, uh, 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 Tony Collette. Tony uh? Collette. Someone else. Leslie Bibb. Okay. Oh, and uh, oh, I'm seeing here oh, a tiny little person. Ooh, who's this? Zoe Deutsch. Oh. Here she is standing on my hand. Tiny. Zoe Deutsch first. Uh, Nicholas Holt plays a guy who gets called in for jury duty. Uh, but he might have done it. He realizes as he's hearing about the crime that he, in fact, might be. Oh, whatever wow. it is. I don't know what the crime is. I guess is. Could, this could happen to anyone. Clint shot okay. it in a weekend yesterday. It's coming out tomorrow or whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things, you yeah. know. I didn't know about this. He's going. He's I going he into production two weeks after the movie comes out in theaters. <laughs> They've set a release date, and he's going to start filming right Everyone after was that. so, like, Cry Macho. It's like, that's it. He's done. It felt like a I real Cry Macho film. is a movie where if you're just, like, someone sneezes on this guy, you make totally. it blasted against a wall. And not only that, but, like, there were all these Jason Kalar stories of him, like, being like, why are we fucking making Clint Eastwood movies? Warner yes, Brothers is never yes, making a Clint Eastwood yes, movie ever again. And you were like, well, that's a picture app on Clint. Right. And he is, I'm still alive. I ran that fucker out of town. <laughs> HBO Max, my ass. I got Zaslav wrapped around my finger. <laughs> I railroaded him. I'm going to make a movie about how I railroaded his ass what into if, giving me $40 million. What if Clint's the one leaking all the, the, the Zaslav slam pieces? Clint's the one who, like, every time the studios what, were letter? like... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that, yeah. no, no, yeah. Handwritten. Yeah. What were you going to say, David? Just, like, during negotiations, he's just calling Zaslav being, like, sweat it out. <laughs> You're going to win the next round, I bet. Do more interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Make commencement speeches. You've got him against the wall. I want Clint's final movie to be called The Railroader. And it reveals that him. he is, in fact, the one railroading everyone. everyone. Changeling, he did that. 15 to 17 to Paris, he he got he was driving I'm the train. I'm the ac- architect of all your pain. And I'm a terrible father. A horrible husband. <laughs> I'm railroading you. <sighs> he should make a Biden movie. Yes. He should be like, this guy's getting railroaded for being too old. He's like, the guy's a spring chicken. I got 10 years on him. Why are we railroading him? <laughs> he should pivot to Biden late in life. Be like that the most boring run movie of Exactly. All time. Be a masterpiece. It'd be incredible. All right. Just Biden be Biden like himself. walking into rooms and sitting down and being like, okay, what's he would, up? He would cast Biden as Biden, right? Oh, this guy's got it. <laughs> He's one of those faces. Yeah, well, and Biden would be like, I'll go do this for a while. <laughs> yeah, sure. You know, yeah. Just, what else Nothing's is he going doing? on? Yeah. It's a lunch break. We'll film the whole yeah, thing yeah, during yeah. a lunch break. Um Okay. okay. So Lisbeth, what a what a bizarre tangent. Uh you should make Lisbeth, a Lisbeth movie. She All got right. railroaded by Sweden. Um 
No, he would never. The no. books are too long. He, he yeah. needs to finish a book before lunch. She's too on computer for him. That's also That's true. That's true. Yeah, he doesn't know her. Is there a computer in any Clint mm. movie? Well, like Olivia Wilde uses a computer in like yeah, a but maliciously. or whatever. Yes. Right, yeah. She like puts her boobs on the computer. Yeah. She ty- she's, she's like, using my, a pitchfork. my dick's getting hard <laughs> typing an article. That's how she talks in that movie. Like, oh, yeah, no, I know. It's a sensitive and nuanced portrayal of journalism. <laughs> I love railroading people. She works for the railroad. That's what the newspaper's <laughs> called. <laughs> the Daily Railroad. <laughs> oh, okay. Jesus I li- I Christ. Like her in that, I gotta say. You like her and Richard yeah, Jewell? Yeah, you know what? I think it, I think it works. You know, because she's. So... I mean, it works in the in that blunt force way that those Clint movies often yeah. are, where it's like, yeah, the, everyone's going to be a pretty defined character. That movie is ten out of ten. So, yeah. I, I mean, I genuinely think yeah. that movie is ten out of ten. I think yeah. that movie's good. Yeah. Like, I think she's so over the top that it lets Ham really go sort of insidious. If I ever get yeah. drunk at a bar with him, who I understand does not drink. sober, please. Yes, right. I know. But Don't if I that. ever, I, I'm you, drunk. And okay. he'd just be sort of naturally charming. Okay. I'd be like, literally, how many times did Clint even talk to you on the set? My guess yeah. is once, right? Yeah. Like, he was just like, you get it. You know, like, so just, good just rolling him out there on a dolly. <laughs> My my favorite scene. He's so perfect for that movie. No, no, I think the characterizations in Richard Jewell are like surprisingly uh, uh, nuanced, considering it's late period Clint. And I love the scene where Olivia Wilde finally collects the final Infinity Stone, puts it on her gauntlet, and uses her power to railroad Richard Jewell. Okay, so we should pick up with the movie. Yes, and we were talking about the biblical uh so verses. creepy yeah and how that's connected to all of these old murders and it's so like it's in the book it really freaked me out and i had seen the movie by the time i was reading the book i don't know if you, i was really rattled at that point where you, like where he's like going through every verse of the oh, bible oh yes 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 mm-hmm. and there's and you're just like right this shit is just in the bible you know like these yeah. sort of like weird explicit murdery rules you know, if a woman lays with a, you know, like, you know, then you shall do all this specific stuff to her. Like, Bible, the original torture porn? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, well, and I Eli think they Roth sort of, never? they sort of lay out the cases of all these all in one. I guess we're sort of skipping over when they finally meet. Because he's like, I need a research assistant. Well, we, sure. We, if we want to talk about the meeting more, we obviously praise yeah, but those, the meeting those scene. Those cases, are, they spend way more time in the book explaining all these murders and how they're based in these Bible verses, and right. they're all gross, and they're all scary. They're all scary. And they're all sad. And yeah, right, whereas this gets boiled down to a slideshow. Of gruesome images. Of gruesome images mm-hmm. where, uh, you know, Elizabeth is like, I'm not done, you know, do, 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 you know, like, this happened, this happened, this happened. Whereas in the book, they're like going to like, there's this weird murder in the bar, and let's go talk to the farmer, and yeah, the farmer would be like, I found this girl with no head. The, I mean, sure. the mystery is clearly the part of this story that fincher is least interested in right i think so i yeah. think he's done seven he's done enough of this stuff yeah you're right right you know and, and, and like he says in in all the materials like it's the their relationship is what i'm most motivated by yeah like as a storyteller the other thing fincher said in the commentary is like they cut entire family members out of the film they yeah. shot him interviewing different people going and meeting a bunch of them you're left with a film where basically Stalin Svarsgaard is introduced early on and there are no and he's other like credible guy. suspects. And he was like, the movie was too long and it just felt like none of this is really important. He was like, the thing we reshot the most was his wall of suspects. Mm-hmm. Because as we removed them from the story, we'd have oh, to yeah. reshoot the wall and never introduce them even as an idea. Yeah, right. there's one of the bangers that you'll never believe that Mikhail is sleeping with in mm. the book. Yeah, the, she is in the movie. She's, she's played it. by, um, what's it called? Um, Geraldine James. Oh, sure. But she's barely have, in the yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in the book, a that's affair. a long affair yeah. where he has to break up with her once he starts sleeping with Lisbeth and yeah. she's kind of upset about it. It's like Then they break... all have dinner and it's like, whatever. There's a lot of that shit. They have that, so much health care there that even when people break up, they can all sit at a dinner table and be like, man, it's fine. The, the case... <laughs> the safety net is just so strong. That's the real stuff. You're like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Um, no, the case is like basically solved by the moment he hires Lisbeth. Or, or should I say, Lisbeth helps him so much so quickly. Yes. Yeah. She sort of supercharges it. Yeah. He obviously, like, the piece he needs is, you know, what did she see? Yeah. And they don't realize that until 
the end of the move, you know, the right. end of the third or fourth act or whatever. Yeah. They realize it at the same time in parallel, right? Mm -hmm. That she saw her brother. But separately. Yes, right. but they put mm -hmm. that together. Now, she realizes it by looking through the archives, mm -hmm. right? And he realizes it by going to visit the guy who's like, I'm just going to come out here and say it. I am a Nazi, right? Like everyone yeah. else is sort of like, you know, they're kind of like, Oh, Sweden's past is complicated. And then sure. there's that one guy who just sits in his like wall of photos and he's just like, we shouldn't bury the past. But this is such a Fincher worldview thing. And it is the the Skarsgård monologue. And on the like commentary, Fincher was just salivating where he's like, this is like my favorite kind of dramatic setup is both of these guys know what the other guy knows. And they know that the other guy knows. They know that they both know. But the difference is that Skarsgård is basically weaponizing politeness against him. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is, I'm banking on the fact that you think you're smarter than me, that I'm not aware that you know, and that yeah. if I ask you to do something innocuous and you say no, you're giving up the fact that you've cracked the case. So right. you'll yeah. come inside, you'll have the drink, like, when when the reality is, he can leave at any time. Yeah, totally. Well, I think also, like, the book and the film both kind of set you up to almost feel, like, bad for Stellan Skarsgård because... Wenger is like, yeah, it's my nephew. He took over the company over me, and he's not doing very good. Right. You're always like, nah, he's not doing a good job at his job. So you're like, oh, this guy, you know, sort of fail son esque, yes. where it's right. like, right, right, you know, right, but he's charming. Presiding so like, you know, over throw this him a bone. He's empire. such a throw him your bone kind of guy uh, until he's throwing the bones. He's throwing the bones. Um, just to lay out what the plot of, you know, what the actual thing is, is that mm -hmm. you know, Harriet and her brother Martin, South mm -hmm. Scars were both being abused by their father. Who is played by Julian Sands in Flashback? No, right? Julian, or no, Julian Sands, Sands is, is uh, Christopher Plummer. Plummer yeah. Right? yeah, young Plummer. I forget who plays uh, the dad, the but who is an evil drunk, you know, Nazi Nazi abuser. Yes, um, Harriet. He killed... basically plays Kevin Spacey's dad. Go on. Sure, uh, Harriet killed her father um, when he was like drunk. She like hit him in the head with an oar, and he drowned. Mm -hmm. And then once. Like the the next summer is when she realizes, like, oh, my brother's just going to take over my father's role, sure, and I'm going to never escape this cycle of abuse. And that is when she gets out of there. Yeah, she didn't die. Yeah, that's the secret. she's not dead. That's what always felt so obvious to me. Sure, with the you know the sort of she simply became Jolie Richardson. But that's yeah. once again, it's like in the reframing of this movie when he cuts out the other suspects and whatever. It's like she's the only other person that really makes an impact. When Nightfist, uh, Nightfist, excuse me, uh, uh, what's Blom the character's name? Blomquist. Blomquist, Blomquist goes, goes and meets her. with her, and she has prominent villain. She's an actor you've seen before. Sure. Where you're like, she has to be important to this in some way. Mm -hmm. Certainly, yes, that she, that he goes from meet a random sibling, and she's like, yeah, my sister was weird. Anyway, I don't have anything else for you. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you're like, yeah, this does seem odd. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't put, it, to me, it's a, it's a decent twist because it, you know, it's why Martin wasn't there. Like, you know, it's yeah. how the alibi functions. Yes. And it makes two things feel very profound to me. One, that she's setting the sending the flowers. Mm -hmm. And the way that she interprets it is like, I'm this hey, is I'm a okay. sign of life. And she doesn't understand that it's actually torturing him. Mm -hmm. That to me is such a great, like, sort of upsetting and sad and melancholy kind of thing. Yeah. And then the other, like, the moment, which is so powerful in both movie and book, where Blancfist is like, so you did kill Harriet. And Martin is so upset to hear. He's like, no, where is she? Like, yeah, do you right, know? Right. And like, because like, that's why Martin has tolerated this the whole fucking time. Yes. He's like, maybe he'll actually this find out what happened to my sister, case. which is the mystery I can't get over. Yes. Like, I lost my sister who I was going to like fucking, you know, torture for the rest yeah. of my life. Uh, Jolie Richardson's really good in this movie. She's a good actor. Fincher in the commentary says, uh, he, he doesn't even like talk around it. She clearly did not like doing a Fincher amount of takes. Sure. And her attitude of just like, please leave. I don't want to answer more of these questions. He was like, I genuinely think she was just pretty fed up. She sent in like a tape for the audition. I loved it. I cast her. Right. You know, but I didn't audition her in person. And then she came in and was just very quickly fed up with my whole process, right. which I think lends something. She'd also done seven years at Nip Tuck. I mean, everyone was sure. kind of fed up at that point. Um, but he said it, the final scene where she is reunited with Christopher Plummer, right? He said, like, look, I'm just, I want, I know you don't like doing a ton of takes. So I'm just going to load in your head. This is the number one thing I want you to think about when you play this scene. And the other part was that, like, uh, 
uh, Plummer is so vulnerable there. He breaks down so quickly, right? She's going to start crying when she sees Plummer, the actor, crying. Right. And he's like, the thing you need to keep in your mind before the waterworks start is you walk in, you see him. He looks really bad. You have not seen this guy in decades. And it's like alarming how much older he is, but also what a frail state he's in. And then I want you to process that the reason he looks so bad and he's gotten so sick and is in such a frail state is largely because this thing has driven him crazy. Right. What you thought, as you said, like sending him the flowers like will the help. splinter in his mind. Him. Yes. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. some degree, there's an amount of guilt you're holding of. I didn't quite understand the effect I was having. Right. Yeah. Which right. is she very profound. should have sent a post-it that's like, I'm good. I'm good. Um, and so all of that is so, I'm. Tr- but yeah, I'm trying to, well, I guess the other thing that's going on during this investigation, yes. Is that Blomquist and Stolander? They kiss? They kiss. They they sex. They have sex. Yeah. Well, first they're friends. First they are, f- or... They're, they're sort of frenemies to, to well, lovers. Like, it's like, But, like, their introduction scene, obviously, is, like, he's barging into her house, and he's like, you afforded me no right to privacy when you, like, shuffle through my life. So I'm just sure. barging into your house after you, like, hooked up with some rando. And I'm like, you know, get on the case. And obviously she's like resistant to it. But I think his directness with her is so different to every, everyone else. When they see, say, see Elizabeth, they're like, she's scary. I don't even want to look right. at her. Right. And he actually like meets her head on, which he, I think is why he she's. Well, he her brings life. her she's, breakfast. He's like, yes. you should, you should have some breakfast. He brings her what I believe are filled bagels, which they're always talking about in the books. And I'm always yeah. like, get me a fucking like filled purple. bagel. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. No, he like, he like basically courts her like you win favor with a cat. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Good call. Right. Yes. Yeah. And there's just like a sensitivity and thoughtfulness to how he is engaging with her and clearly yeah. understanding that she's like prickly. Right. And distrusting of people that immediately registers for her as like, oh, I can trust him because he's actually thinking about this. He's also kind of an asshole and she's kind of an asshole. Totally. Like they're root. Yes. And I feel like I like that the 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 seeing like him just barge in and not really be polite in any way and she's the like yeah like never polite to There's, anyone barely yes. acknowledges anyone none of the niceties well, but 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 incredibly incredibly smart character detail is when he barges in she's just had a one night stand with yes. this one well, she meets at the club right and she goes yeah. into the bedroom and says like do you need to stay here you can stay here as long as you want right right, right. basically like messages to her I will kick him out sure. if you need to stay in this space, which it's not like you're in danger, but it speaks more to she is never protected in her life. So she immediately has the consideration of like, what are your emotional wants right now? Do you want to stay in bed with me for another six hours cuddling? Or do you want to like get out of here and go to work? You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just think that's like a really, really fine sure. detail. No, I, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. I mean, she's always doing that in the books too. She's always like, to a random friends like you want to live in my apartment like right. I'm you know I'm getting well, out yeah, of here Mimi for a while is like Mimi. her sort of friend slash on again off again girlfriend right. who after she gets her boobs done Mimi's like I love your new boobs she said lesbianly or something <laughs> it's so crazy <laughs> the sex scene with them is like so like because I'm a lesbian I love your new boobs it's like this is so fucking Fuck stupid um, R.I.P. Steve Larson R.I.P. <laughs> I'm sorry about what died too young to you. David weirdly implied that you were like out of shape and maybe yeah. he doesn't know what he's talking about I think he smoked a lot of cigarettes that's my impression of him you're he's, doubling down on this yeah in a he's weird drinking way. and smoking like a you know good okay. old fashioned Swedish journalist okay. no I have no idea yeah. um, they get together mm-hmm. they have a weird yin yang kind of thing as researchers right like you know like they yes. they, they, they complement each other perfectly yeah she's good at computer he's good at like she has photographic people. memory yes. right she can remember everything in the book that's a very profound moment where he asks her that and she gets really upset yeah i hate that moment in the I, book i also don't really understand it in the book it's like her secret shame that she has a photographic memory and this it's more like yeah that's own it her superpower yeah right. she keeps well sometimes will like dip away from him and start mm-hmm. crying and he's like what's up and she's like i'm weird aren't i and it's like we don't we don't need this no. he's just like oh cool Right. I mean, obviously, the true reason she's interested in Blomquist is that he accepts her at face value and is not judgmental at all. Yeah. Because that's his personality. Yes. Right. Um, um, but the vibes of just, like, drink tea, have sweater, go on computer, 
during this kind of like third, you know, it's just yeah. great, uh, impeccable. Yeah. No? My friend Aubrey always no, no, says, so sexy to have a project. That That is which Aubrey's is... Letterbox Review, which I have favorited. Oh, I was looking so at all good. my favorite So sexy Letterboxd to have reviews. a project. It's so um, true. Yep. And, uh, you know, Nick Minnick said, I want Daniel Craig to be my small, cold boyfriend. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes, I, lo- I love all of this. Well, it's it's a uh, 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 e girl hacker ghost girlfriend disgraced cold journalist boyfriend couple goals, right? <laughs> Um, yeah. This um, is sort of my household, but gender swapped. Yes, yeah. right. Your yeah. your yeah. your partner is goth. We were saying this. Goth, goth adjacent. Yes, yeah. is sort of is is more gothy, and, and is you're on more, computer. Uh, but and you're yeah. more. And I'm like glasses. glasses and a sweater, also on computer, but different way. They're also they're one of us on PC, one on Mac. You know, they're all conspiring to run you off a of friend magazine. Yeah. There's been a coup brewing <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh. They're railroading me. Computer right now. Fincher said basically Brand magazine. Sorry, what? <laughs> Fincher said the the scene where they sleep together for the first time. He After was like, he gets shot. Right. He gets shot he gets or he doesn't get shot, but he, he gets, gets shot him and he gets grazed. Yes. Yeah. And he's like kind of freaking out. And she nurses him in this right. very sexy way with the uh with the Swedish vodka. And yes. the dental floss. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, the movies love when a girl is stitching up a hot guy. I, I, I mean, love. I love. I love. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. Fincher says funny basically. Thing. She has sex with him the first time to calm him down. Yes. Right. right? There's something so very pragmatic about it. That she's like, pants off. You right. Know? Yeah. Right. And then, God, I'm trying to remember what moment it is. But he's like, the moment where they actually achieve intimacy is not when they have sex. I mean, there's that really great moment after they've solved the murder where they're in bed. That's looking like, put, at your, each other. put your hand up my shirt again or whatever. Well, put that's, your hand back. that's later. He's like, that's when she's really fallen for him. Right. Yeah. It's so good. She's admitting that she like wants his presence. Right. But, you, you know, it's yes, it's the it's the morning after the comfort of their conversation where she's like, oh, I might be catching feelings. Well, man. Um, and then it, it's much later. But when she asks him for the money. Right. And he's like, I don't have it. And she's like, I know the exact amount in your bank account. Right. Five trillion kronen or whatever. <laughs> sure. And then he doesn't Which question Which is only it. like $100. Right. right. He doesn't question it. And he's like, yeah, sure. Just pay me back. And she's like, seriously? And he's like, yeah, do you want a coffee? He's like, that's the moment she's ruined. Right. Basically, emotionally, which sets up the ending of the film. I think what makes it so devastating is that she's like, no one has ever trusted her that much in her life. No. No one has. Beesnitch is the closest or whatever. And he... Yeah is still, that character is clearly still kind of afraid of Lisbeth. Right. Like, he wants her to feel, like, he has that line where he's like, look, she's had a hard life. Like, yeah. I don't need to make it harder. But he doesn't think of her as a human. He still thinks of That's her as, like, thing. a wounded pet. But yeah. he doesn't question her Whereas at Bong all. Whereas Bongfist is, right. Yeah, and no, she, he's just like, yeah. that to her means more in terms of a sense of intimacy than anything she's experienced before in her life. But she doesn't get the different levels they're on of how they're seeing each other. And it's why when... Craig, you know, when Bonkvist gets kid captured by Skarsgård mm-hmm. uh, and put into murder basement, <laughs> uh, that uh, she's like, yes, it's in parallel that she's realized, but like they just at that point they are like symbiotic. Yes, yeah, and like she knows how to get him and she knows what's going on. You know, like they, they she just like you're not really, and she's in not doubt. like damsel in distress. No, she he's fucking he's clocks damsel. him with a golf club. He he's, is well, he's damsel in hell. The, the um, uh, may I kill him thing is mm-hmm. all about like. Here he is. He's this, like, ultimate male ally, right? He is the one guy who sort of doesn't uh, objectify her or other her, and he, like, fights for the rights of women who have been abused and murdered. He's trying to break open these cases. He's trying to expose this sort of abuse. He's in the pussy hat. Right. And it's like, until the moment that fucking Skarsgård ties him up, he is never actually experienced basically. No. Sure, yeah. Right. Not that we know. And so yeah. from the moment she lets him down, he's like, I've now actually lived through some version for a sliver of the other side of this, which is basically her saying, may I kill him? Do you get it now? Right. Do you get that this, like, the existential threat I feel at all times versus just the idea of rallying for a sense of justice in the world? Now, in the books, um, there is this backstory for Mikhail that he solved a crime when he was a teenager. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and his last name is Blancfist. Uh huh. And as we know. Yep. And so all the characters call him Kale Blancfist, which is the name of essentially Swedia's, Sweden's Encyclopedia Brown. Okay. Like a very famous Swedish character that is like a young detective. So, right? Yeah. 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 So like Larson named the character. Correct. It's a after, joke. Okay. And Elizabeth is always calling him Kalle fucking Blomqvist. Like, that's yeah. her, like, joke about him. Uh-huh. And he accepts it from her. 
we know so we know a little bit more about him as this like kind of like try hard throughout his life in the books in the movies someone calls him that one time in, in the movies I mean, in a way that's uh, weird it's like an arcane reference for any american like i had no idea what i, I was almost Google surprised it. to yes. see it in there it might be Skarsgård at the end calls sure. calls him that for like a second and it's, they don't get into it but i was almost surprised at that point to even hear reference to it it's like if his name was like sherlock johnson and everyone called like, him Sherlock Holmes facetious. Uh, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, that's what it is. Exactly. And he hates it. Yeah. And, like, so, yes, I think there's this ed- this chip on his shoulder in the books of, like, I want to be, like, a real, you know, sure. detective, I not, guess. Not a little boy, middle exactly. grade fiction detective. Yeah. Okay. Um, but we should talk, I mean, look, yeah, I agree that Fincher cares the least about the murders in this. Yeah. But when... He's doing a murder basement scene with he, like yeah. you're just like there's no one better at this no. like at making this so intense. Go on the man. real to real that Go, detail yes. of the high end stereo system. Yes, there's just something so chilling about that in general with just murderers yeah. of having a high end stereo system. Yes. And the choice of song well, remind me what it but is. He has, Enya. He has right. upgraded Artists. his high end stereo sort system of... in decades. No, I think it's I think it's actually he's such a purist. An audiophile, yeah. That he wants like and this he, like impl- analog, right. really like high quality format. And the implication he 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 plays this to like drown out the screams. This right? is the yeah. thought he hates I he hates killing. Right. And he wants to hear a song he likes. This is his right. his serenity. It was Daniel Craig who famously yes. suggested yeah, Orinoco big lore. Flow. It's right. just funny to imagine him like you know he's in the harness he's like what about sail away sail away and they're like what are you talking about he's like oh don't go flow like, it was no it and was then they're all laughing they're I, like that'd right. be crazy it was when they were in rehearsal i think you're right yes yeah and he says they're like what should the music be i, it might, I don't think it was on set i think it was I think, like I, table there's no way rehearsal. it was on set but it, it was like zalian and fincher and craig and they were like what should be on the the real to real and craig just goes like on a rico flow um, and runs out of the room, and they were like, "Hold it just... up on his iPod." Well, he runs out to grab his iPod, yeah, yeah, yeah. but Fincher and Zalian and turn to each other and are like, "Did he just have a stroke? What the fuck is on a Rico flow?" Like he just blurted out this thing and then came back with the iPod and played it. And Fincher was like, "I thought that was called Sail Away, Sail Away." Right. Wow. Uh, Fincher's other quote is, "This guy's gonna make Blancas as Metro as we need," which is yes, funny. wow, Metro, uh, two thousand ten, much- baby. I know. Um, I wonder if anyone is still actively. I'm Metro. I'm very I'm Metro. Metro. I'm very yes. Metro. What is okay. it again? You wear a suit, but in and you get a pedicure, no, but you're yeah, straight. You brush hair, yeah. whatever that means. Straight, but brush hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's like H and M. Yeah. Um, straight, but take showers. <laughs> At some point, the bar for metrosexual became so low. Um, scars, scar, and you know, just the the shot of scars guard, like get in there. Yeah. Gas comes on. What scars? Scars guys already got the, the gas mask, mask on, yeah. and then just like, yeah, the the practice kind of like, all right, you know, here we are in the harness, and he's like, yeah. ask me some questions. Come on, you're a journalist. Let me monologue. And Craig's like, Ugh. and he's like, why did I kill the girls? Well, let me tell you. You know, like he doesn't even. Daniel Craig yeah. is. Yeah, I had so, a girl down here during dinner. He's so good at being tortured. He is right. I mean, like the Casino Royale scene mm-hmm. is like Hall of Fame playing being tortured, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and this he plays so well. I love the shot from his POV with yes. the plastic the, bag. Oh. oh, it's so scary! So cool. It's really cool. How they, they do, how they do that? Uh, I don't know. I don't put bag over camera. Oh, <laughs> you're kidding. Hold uh, vacuum cleaner <laughs> underneath bag. Um, David, when you said like it, it's the parties at least interested in, but it, the second you get down to the murder basement, like. David Fincher getting to film in a murder basement is is it's like, like giving a basketball to Michael Jordan. Vincent Minnelli like, being like, and Gene Kelly, I now just let you dance. Yeah, hundred percent. Like, there's this one crazy camera move that, like, I'm obsessed. I need to rewatch the whole sequence live and just do a commentary. This has like sometime. become a comfort food movie for you, yes. has it not? Yes. Yeah, you watch, watch it a all lot. The time. I, I I just love the feelings. Like that is what I love about it. Yeah. I love the aesthetic, obviously, of like cold murder. You know, I do like that. I know why that's broadly appealing. You hate hot murder. I hate. No, I do hate hot murder. Yes, yeah. I want cold, um, cold case, cold murder, mm-hmm. cold climate. But I uh, know just the feelings of the two of them, like their their eyes, like yeah. throughout the movie. Just right. That's what I love. I mean, yeah. You're you're positive on this movie. I like it more every time I rewatch it. Right. But which I think is true for a lot of people. It mm-hmm. it puts me in a bad mood. 
generally. It was the feel bad movie of Christmas. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and it does make me feel bad. And I'm sick of people being like, well, feeling bad is actually sort of the new feeling good. It's like, no, no, no. Um, Who says that to you, Pinhead? Yeah, Pinhead <laughs> says that to me. Um, no, I think it just, you know, it's 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 scary. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, it's it, it is scary. It's intense. It ends on such a note that makes me feel like actually sad. That's why I love it's the incredibly incredibly sad. No, and I think it's what it's amazing, but it's never going to be like, oh, I'll just put this on. Right. No, no, all you the know, maybe if you make they... a Tumblr supercut of just hey, hey. It's, <laughs> it's all the sadder because they don't make the sequels. It is. I mean, in the sequels, the idea of them being romantic is dispensed with, I sure. will say. Yeah. Like, they are no they're longer... They're, like, pissed at each other. It's not... They're pissed at each other for so much of the sequels. They do finally reunite, and yeah. they do succeed. I'm just saying... But they're never... The romance is gone. I kind of love that it's just her riding off well, on the motorcycle. this being the final shot and him never making the sequels, you're just like, maybe they never talk ever again. Right. See, I thought of you with the thing of, like, f when food is left uneaten. Mm -hmm. That fucking jacket oh. is... Oh, it's... Cr Gorgeous! It looks the woman incredible. can shop. I mean, God, yeah. it looks you know. incredible. It's a custom-made leather jacket, yeah. and the fact that it's wasted, yeah, it's so it sucks. It's so disheartening. It upsets me extremely. Yeah, ben me wanted too. to like Sherlock Junior into his TV screen to pull the jacket out of the dumpster. Um, <sighs> look. So look, I mean, we need to we need to start battling towards the ending here. But we yeah, need to so say Lisbeth, okay. Lisbeth, uh, golf clubs, Stellan, you know. Uh, he drives off. She chases him. He explodes. Right. So you don't even get the sort of catharsis of. And then you're like, well, great movie over. Right. And he's like, bonus act. 30 more minutes. Uh, yeah. They have to figure out, of course, what did happen to Harriet. Because mm -hmm. like Bunkus correctly is like, he definitely didn't kill her. Like yes. from his reaction. Uh, and yes, Jolie Richardson is in fact Harriet. Uh, and we learn all of this and then they reunite. That scene is quite powerful. Agreed. Uh, mm -hmm. Plumber nailing it. But then the other thing, the what's his name? The guy who uh, sued uh, Blum. Wenner 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 Strum. Right. The, the right. ostensible payment was, of course, I'll let you bring down your your enemy. Mm -hmm. And then he gives him a bunch of bullshit and Blomquist is mad. And Elizabeth's just like, I can just use computer. Well, early, well, early on in the film, right after she's finished the background check on him, she goes to her like one hacker friend to get a thing and she sort of like in the first 15 minutes breaks into Wennerstrom's place and like yeah. hacks a thing there. So she's already like laid the groundwork to yes. figure out what's going on there because she, like Wenger, knows that he was set up. That's right. basically her way of saying I love you. Yeah, of right? course. Right? 100%. Yeah. I, I, I do crime for you. She I put on a wig. wig. She gets, you know, she steals all his fake money. Yeah. And which in the movie, in, in the sequels, then she's like fabulously wealthy because she stole all okay. his money. Like, she buys yeah. a really cool apartment. There's a lot about her cool apartment. Fincher said kind of uh, uh, purposefully her her persona, this disguise she puts together, kind of looks like Robin Wright drag. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Like she's so uncomfortable playing this role, but also to a certain degree she's living in the skin of the kind of woman that Craig is always going to default to. It's sort of camp. It's like funny. It is camp. And she wore this at the Met Gala. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think... What's just crucial is, like you say, when she's doing all of this, she's now extending herself beyond her usual cocoon out of love for Blancfist. Yeah. And he doesn't do anything wrong. He doesn't do anything. I mean, he uses it. He, he obviously uses the evidence. But it, it's he just... He remains a little oblivious. Exactly. He's bimbo, bimbo. forever. And so yeah. when she sees him back with Robin Wright, because she's now short up Millennium Magazine, totally. things are going to well, be they fine. Didn't, they didn't uh, DTR. They never, he gets. They never DTR. Mikhail and Elizabeth never sat down and were like, so are we boyfriend and girlfriend? Yeah. And she just sees him being intimate with him. And I think it's beyond the fact that like, oh, he's, he will still sleep with her. It's like, she's just like, no, he's in society and I can never be in society. That's his home base. Right. Yeah. Yes. Be Beauty and the Beast vibes. A little bit. Yeah. Which uh, there's And then scene... just for Fincher to be like, trash, motorcycle off. And Fincher's like, roll credits. Sure. Get out of here. There's the scene where she goes to the archives and there's the older woman who sort of doesn't want to let her take a look at the files. Yes. And Fincher was like, that was really important to me because like... Uh, She's just so disgusted by Lisbeth's very being. Right, right. He was like, look, a lot of this movie is obviously about misogyny, but also like bureaucracy is against Lisbeth Salander. 100%. Like society is against Lisbeth Salander. Which is what the sequels are very much right. about. Like, right. like the, she is the most unsympathetic victim of all time. The violence the is perpetuated yes. by men, right. but also no one is accepting her other really than Blomkvist. Um, yeah, which which that that's the thing that really hurts her. 
Yeah. And that, like, uh, Craig's always just going to basically default back to Robin Wright. She's the one that he kind of can't get over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they'd done the sequel, she gets a lot of cool stuff to do. But then even the Swedish movies cut that stuff out. Probably just to search for something to cut out. But she has this whole cool subplot. So great. She's a fun character. She's we a great character, yeah. yeah. We were talking about the Social Network episode last week. Uh, the, the sort of interesting, thorny, dramatic tension in the authorship of that movie of you feeling like Sorkin and Fincher uh, alternately uh, admire and uh, uh, are disgusted by different aspects of Zuckerberg as an idea, right? Yeah. They both respect and abhor different aspects of him. I feel like Lisbeth is everything that Fincher likes about Zuckerberg minus the things he hates about him. Right. That that the sort of like someone who embraces technology is a thoroughly modern person who like pisses on the walls of society, you know, and is like actually oppressed by society and is victimized by society and retains a sense of like, I need to do what's right for the right people versus feeling oppressed, having this sort of self-pitying attitude and like using the power vindictively. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. This is like the distillation of everything that he does respect about Zuckerberg minus the the sociopathy. Yeah. And Dan- That's my take. And Daniel Craig is doing the Andrew Garfield thing of being a, a cutie little sweetie. I think being it's a, a cutie great little take. Sweetie. I just want to tell you something. Please. Warner Brothers is going to release a 4K of the Fugitive. What do you think? I saw that still book. Chicago. Looks That's old good. news. That was last night. Chicago. You fucking r slash Steelbooks was all over. I'm, I wasn't right. I wasn't surfing r slash Steelbooks at 10 p.m. Last I'm sorry. Day. You don't have notifications on? <laughs> so. It looks great. I hope it's a good transfer. Uh, me too. Um, this film was nominated for five. Uh, Tim Miller's uh, opening credit sequence. I do think. Unbelievable. Very cool. Yes. Uh, sort of like. And, and oh, and a Trent Karen Reznor. Knows. I care and I was a uh, immigrant song. song, but but uh, Reznor and Atticus Ross's Ross's score. I listen to more than the Social Network score. I love this really? score so much. Wow! It is funny though that Reznor. There's this quote from him in the in the uh, um, dossier where uh-huh. he's like. You know, social network, like, that came out of nowhere in my life. I didn't, you know, really understand anything about, you know, like, that's not a world that I'm in. And going into this, you know, it was a little more like, ah, serial killers and anal rape. Uh, I guess I know what that sounds like. You know, that's more Nine Inch Nails This is like John Williams in 79 cracking his knuckles to do the Superman score. And then the quote just says, I I know what this is. Reznor pauses. Let me rephrase that. A dark (laughs) tone felt more more familiar. Yeah, well, (laughs) it's a good adjustment, Trent. Um, but I know it's. An, I really recommend this score as like moody yeah. writing music. It's yeah. really good. I just like all their scores. Yeah, that they did for the their Challenger the, the score. Man. I feel like I keep chanting it out, which is just like pulsing dance music. Yeah, Fucking well, that movie rocks. won't come out for another fifteen years. They right. did the Mank score, right? Yeah, they did the Mank score. I, I interviewed them about the it. It's a really, score. really good score, and uh, they recorded it in COVID, instrument by instrument, like over Zoom. It's like the, one of the most crazy things. That's crazy. Like, yeah, I should rewatch that. Their their yeah. only Oscar is Social Network, or did they win a second? Didn't they win a, 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 a um? I thought they won Soul? for Mank. No, Soul. did they win for they Soul? They won for Soul. Soul. I was gonna say Soul is an incredibly good. Was it Soul up score. against Mank? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what it is. They beat themselves. Yeah, he has at the two... weird at the Soderbergh Oscars. But they did win for Soul. Choo choo. Yeah, they did. Yeah, the Soul score is amazing. It's you really nice. Yeah, yeah, because the Oscars were in a train station that year. Yep. Uh, Ninja Turtle score that was a surprising one. Really good score. Yeah. Um, they work a lot now. Look, I mean, who knew Trent Reznor would become just a Good Hollywood composer yeah. after 20 years. His fucking years Watchmen is, work is unbelievable. That's, very that's a fucking that's very John Carpenter all yeah. the time. HBO what? Yeah. Okay. Cool. I have to go see Saw in like 10 minutes. So <laughs> we've been so, recording for almost three hours. Saw 10 minutes from now? Exactly. I have to see Saw in X minutes. Mm. This film came out Christmas. Feel bad movie. 2011. We talked about this. We've I done this like box office different... game three times. Okay. So I two of the previous times we've done it. Are War Horse and Tintin both getting released? That is correct. The same week, right? Uh, number five and number seven. Okay, so I'm trying to think what the third time we would have done this is. The sandwich in between them at number six. Give me a genre. Oh, well, oh what? You know, let's hear the genre. Comedy. How do you know? Family comedy. No. Nope. Family That's comedy. 2010. What were you going to guess, friend? Oh, I just know. I feel like I know one of the other movies in the top. 
but I'll wait. No, no. This one's not this. in the top five, Fran, so. Fran, take your shot. Well, I just know the same day that I saw this movie in theaters, I saw Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. That is, is that number also? one at yep. the box office. Well, and that, okay. had, that came out the week before. And we've done that on day. Patreon, so we've done that. That's what well. I did that's on Patreon thought, yeah. and main feed, my friend. Right. So, so four times. No, but that came out the week before. So we did that. That's the week before Ghost Protocol. Two weeks ago. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Right. Because it had the weird uh, IMAX. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay. Um, but uh, so Ghost Protocol is number one, expanding to wide. Okay. Uh, number two is Dragon Tattoo. No, is a sequel that we literally just mentioned. You thought it came out on a different year. I thought it came out in a different... And this is why I knew it came out 2011. <sighs> Fuck. And is it Sherlock Holmes? Sherlock Holmes. Game of, Game of Shadows. A Game of Shadows. Wow. Coming out. Uh, that has also been out for two weeks. Okay. And that movie did pretty good, it considering did. it's like not really well-remembered, right? It doesn't like, exist, yeah. No, it's yeah. sort of like open It made 186 domestic. Right, because the first one opened so huge, yeah. and this one opened lower, and people were like, I guess Bloom's off the rose, and then it fucking held. Number and they're making their third one. They're making it right now. They're about to do it. They just need to finish their coffee, and then they're going to go do it. Number three is Dragon Tattoo, which, of course, uh, grossed a grand total of 102 domestic. Yeah. Not bad. What is it? Pretty good. Worldwide? Um, it did uh, 130 international for 232 worldwide. Okay. Cost. For a $90 million movie, yeah. it's not like the worst thing in the world, but obviously no. they wanted a, a franchise starter here. it was going to be humongous. Um, but again, on the other hand, this is a two hour, 40 minute movie yep. with like a lot of really, really intense material. It, it is a victim of expectations. It, it is worth making a sequel outside of you thinking this movie is going to make $300 million domestic and then it looking like a flop and and win best picture or whatever. Look, and like some some movies got sequels, such as number four at the box office. Is this a the worthy one? sequel? No. OK. This was the sequel or it gets a sequel? This is the, I think, third film in uh, a franchise. What genre? Uh, family comedy animated, and, and this isn't the one we've semi covered already. Animated. No, this isn't. It's semi. If animated. we cover this, it's because you made me. It's the road trip. No, mm. fuck. No, that's the fourth one, I believe. Yes. Oh, it's this is shipwrecked? the third one. Okay. Chip, Alvin and the Chipmunks shipwrecked. shipwrecked. I don't care about those guys. No, I believe it's a Mike Mitchell film. That's right. It's Spoon the controls guy. It. Right. Yeah. No, and then you got Tintin. What's at number six? Opening this week, we this covered it on this we podcast. The family yes. comedy, family-ish comedy. We've d invoked another film by this director on this very podcast. Clint Eastwood family comedy. No, <laughs> not me. We've invoked another film by this director. We've covered this director in full. Oh, it's uh, we bought a zoo. Cha Ching. Dun, 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 we bought a zoo. Dun, 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 dun. I haven't seen it. I feel like I know what happens. Great American movie. You would be, Fran, you he would be surprised. You might be surprised. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Some of the twists You'd be surprised. Uh, you've also got War Horse. You've got New Year's Eve. You've got The Darkest Hour, but not the, uh, you know, Gary Winston Oldman. Churchill one. You've it's got the, the, it's like Chloe the Griffin teens. Moritz right, yeah. Film. Yeah, okay. And you have Jason Siegel in The Muppets. Yeah, mm -hmm. a movie I loved at the time and now think is in many ways culturally responsible for a lot of the worst trends in Hollywood. A little bit. I argue uh, that is the original, might be one of the originals. codifying of the legacy sequel. Yeah, the movie the, is like, about how great the fans are. Exactly, right. Of and and how and how we have to have a scene where this happens. We have to have a scene yes. where that happens. And it, it fucking played me like a fiddle when I saw it in theaters. Yeah, and I, I I've it's it's perhaps been diminished by other people running its playbook. How do you feel about Muppet? I like when they're getting all the Muppets back together, and they yes, go to the dog in the hammock, and they're like, "You want to come?" And he's like, "Yeah, okay." That's such a good bit. Such a great bit. There are, that's funny. Fun, you know, because all the others are like sort of high concept. And like, that guy would just get. The first time the Muppets had been successfully funny in over 10 years. So I grant it a lot. Sure. Because right. like the, the bits are really good. Right. But it is wild if you look at that movie, how much it feels like Force Awakens is using that as the template. No, you're, you're of, totally like, right. Here's the fan who's obsessed with the legacy of all these characters and has to bring them all back together to remake the original thing. Well, it's also like last year I rewatched all the Muppet show when it was on Disney Plus. It might still be on Disney Plus. The greatest and TV it's show like of all once time. I watched that as an adult, I was like the Muppets movies. What is this? You know. But the, but it's in that same way that Force Awakens is doing it. It's like we're just going to reset everything back to what the show was. We're going to recreate the show. Right. And wipe away like 20 years of versions of these characters that people don't like. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The Muppet um, show is the best. Yeah. The Muppet show is the, the best. Of television. 
Um, you got to show it to your daughter, Dana. I will. I, when she's ready. When when she's is a ready. good time? No, no, she's no. definitely not. When she is needs a good to know who all the guys are. Yeah, she's not into Diane Cannon like, Yeah, That's a good way to introduce her. <laughs> yeah, there's going to have to be a lot of explaining of 80s celebrities to her, I guess. If this we was so that. much of my childhood was watching the Muppet Show and being like, that person's my favorite actor. And my parents being like, they died 35 years ago. <laughs> There's no new... I can't believe you're, this podcast Twitter account is what told me that James Reborn was dead. Reborn? Yeah. Reborn? Yeah, I, mean, I, re- I genuinely didn't know. Dead. And he's been dead. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, that's I not new. I didn't know. He's, he's... Now, why would I know that? Am I Googling dead? One of the best to ever do it. Are you Googling dead? You should... Is that what you just yeah. said? Yeah. Fran, you should set Google News alerts for dead. For dead, yeah. Just so you don't miss these. Yeah, if I thought that, this movie is a bad vibe. My Google alert for dead will dead. help. Uh, anything else on the box office worth talking about? Uh, we honestly did a good job with this one. I Great. thought we would have to blast through it, but we would blast through and we should do a backup. But I don't think that we need to. Lane. Yeah. We hadn't. All these were. Well, it's time for Saw. Years ago. Time for Saw. Saw one and a half. Saw it is almost time for Saw. Saw it off, David. Vroom, vroom. This one was not ready for five Oscars. It won. Editing. Editing. That's a somewhat one. surprising win because usually that goes to a Best Picture nominee. Yes. Right. I remember once it won, you were like, oh, well, now best picture go anyway. And then it went one way. With, with pleasure? With pleasure. Yeah. What if Selen Skarsgård showed up in The Artist, though? Do you know that movie? them all and put <laughs> them all. <laughs> what are you talking about? 400 Academy Awards. I swear that's the actual, if you look at it, they invented new categories just to give to the artist. One of the, the, the last and worst tricks that Weinstein played on us was like, Everyone loves this. And you look at the box office and you're like, it did okay. It did okay. Like, this wasn't even a phenomenon. No. And he was like, no, Hollywood has fallen back in love with movies through right. the artist. And you're like, it's fine. The, the successful selling of it as a populist people's favorite. Like, Fuck off. Yeah, Fuck but off. so the weird thing is it won, like, every Critics Award Best Picture. What did New York pick that Playing year? at the festivals, I remember some Oscar handicapper being like, look, I think this movie might win as the populist favorite, but no critics award is going to go to this film. God, New York gave it the best picture. That is crazy. You need to take, you need to you would not hold them accountable. You would not believe how many orgs gave it to that. I, look, it is quote unquote, I think it's an amazing year for film, but it is seen as a weak year. Yes. Uh, like The Descendants was obviously one of the really big movies movie, that year. I, do not care. Not about. a big fan of that movie. Yeah. But Moneyball is this year. Moneyball is this year. But, this but year. that's the thing. Moneyball, Dragon Tattoo, even, you know, stuff Tinker, like Tinker Taylor. Tinker Taylor. All Hugh, kind of Hugo. Taken for granted a little. Taken for granted, dismissed as commercial. Yeah. Like, dismissed, or not dismissed, but seen as like, yeah, well, you know. Right. And then like stuff like Melancholia, Tree of Life, uh, you know, maybe just slightly too arty for whatever. No, right? and, no. and you're Margaret, right. Margaret, like, is, is oh, well, there, but it's critical. The great American Steam movie. is just busy. The, right. the uh, Dragon Tattoo arc was so fascinating of it, like, coming out, underperforming a little bit at the box office. The heat before it was like, this is the last movie for people to see. Maybe this comes in and is fucking Oscar runaway, especially because Fincher is sort of overdue now post-social network. What's David's look? There's, There's some, some banging. banging. Yeah. I heard banging. Really? I didn't what is this? Act four of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by David some Fincher? some banging next door. Well, it's um, ramping up. But it felt like they were like, okay, so this has no Oscar chances. Then Fincher got like the DGA nom. It got a PGA right. nom. It suddenly felt like, oh, is this a front runner again? Right. And then it gets actress. It gets editing. It gets uh, sounding. It gets, it gets a handful, but only wins the one. Yeah. And Rooney Marr, that's the real lasting legacy of this is I feel like this is the movie that fully stamps her as like an interesting actress. Um, definitely. And then has a great few years. Yeah. She'll come Culminating back. Culminating in Carol. She's doing something interesting now, Carol. isn't she? Or she just did... She's, Carol good. Carol Carol's good. So good. Uh, what's Rooney doing now? I think she's got something interesting in the hopper. I ain't talking Carol about Dennis. Too? Carol too. Carol Still caroling. Back in New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, well, she made that Lynn Ramsey movie whenever that comes yes. out with, with her husband, Joaquin Phoenix. Yes. I don't know if they're married, but her partner. Yeah. Uh, that seems to be the big one. Maybe she's going to play Audrey Hepburn in a movie? Yeah, which, look, if anyone sure, is. She's sort of going to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fran. I, I, I love her. Final thoughts. And I love Fran. I love Fran. Huh? We uh, all love Fran. You know. My final thought is, oh, I, I hate when they kill the cat. We didn't yeah. mention that the cat gets they chopped up. I hate that. And the fucking, man. That's what I, I'm like, really like, I'm in a bad mood watching that. Who did that, you think? M- Martin did that. 
Oh, th- th- yeah. th- does he confirm it? At a certain point, he's clearly trying to scare Blomkvist off because he says the thing about like, close. you know, it's harder than shooting someone missing them, which is what I did with you. Sure. You know, like, you sure. know and I think the cat is him too. Yeah. yeah. It would be funny if it was like, no, it was that weird old lady. That's what I was going to say. I yeah. think it's the old lady. It well, the, the swastika lady. thing is, we can't get into this. We can't but I always feel this. that it's weird that it's David's a swastika. It feels like he's framing the super old Nazi for it. Right. He might be trying yeah. to just point it to like, yeah, you know. It yeah. was, it's a it's a person that died. It's Nazi Island or whatever. Right. Yeah. That's it. Fran, you're the best. Thank you so much Thank for you're having the best. Me. us. Uh, Fran Magazine. Yeah, Fran Magazine. It, Fran Magazine is wonderful. It's really you good. should really <laughs> subscribe to it. it guys. It's Fran it's is really. the dismissive of her own work. It's not silly. It's, it's a great. Sometimes it is. Well, yeah. well sure. Sometimes. Well, I've been doing you know three months of Maestro blogging, but not enough. Anything, I know I got to ride late. this out through the rest of the year. Exactly. Um, yeah. No, I have a good time on there. We um, have a good time reading it, and everyone thank should. Thank you. Uh, thank you for gifting us with another uh, blockbuster episode. You're mm-hmm. so welcome. Presumably thank you for we'll having just me. Break the charts. Yes. Hope so. Yeah. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Marie Barty for our social media and helping to produce the show and letting Fran know that James Rebhorn had died. Thank you to AJ McKeon and Alex Barron for our editing, Lane Montgomery in the Great American Novel for our theme song, Joe Bowen, Pat Rounds for our artwork. J.J. Birch for being our own little Elizabeth Salander and putting together the research for this episode. He knows how to going, do computer. He go on computer. He knows how to do computer. Uh, you can go to blankcheckpod.com for links to some real nerdy shit, including our Patreon blank check special features, where we are going through the Pierce Brosnan, James Bond movies. Uh, yes. Also, uh, there's a free membership you can sign up for. Every 10 days, we unlock an episode from three years earlier. And I think that's still the Alien franchise. Yeah. That sounds about right. Who knows? Like, we'll never know. I'm telling you, I'm pretty confident that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. 2010, 2020, normal time. But then, yes, um, very soon we will uh, then have Alien Resurrection. It's the one where Ben falls asleep. Good up. Great it's up. A great app. One Trump, of our Trump have COVID. Best. Trump have COVID. Uh, tune in next week. I'm, I'm awake. S- in all right. All right. We got to be done. We got to be done. Tune in next week for Gone Girl. And as always, David, what are you ordering for lunch? Shake Shack. People are going to fucking lose their minds. Chicken sandwich or burger? I'm going to get the chicken sandwich. <laughs>